Father in heaven, when you sent Moses to speak to Pharaoh, you said to him in Exodus 4 verse 12, Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. I ask in the name of Jesus Christ, teach me what to say, that those who come may receive the truth and not my opinions. Bless every person, Father, in this room. Bless every family represented. Guide their steps. Provide their needs. Bless them in their work. Bless them in their studies, dear God. Let their lives reflect your glory. Save all of them when you come, along with those who have come to know you through their lives. Now give me the words, dear God. I offer this prayer from my heart in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Genesis, my favorite book. I love the book of Genesis, and I particularly like the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. Uh, very significant chapters. If in studying any major doctrine of salvation, the root of that doctrine goes back to Genesis. You name major salvational doctrines. Give me a few examples. Say that again. The sanctuary, all right, yes. You can find that back in Genesis, elements of the sanctuary. Something else. Scripture, the word of God, yes, in the very first chapter. Anything else? A major salvation doctrine. I know you're very modest, but give me some answers. What? The second coming. You, that's not what you said? That's traced back to Genesis. And we'll go through that. Any other major salvation doctrine? The law of God. Yes, I'll trace that for you back in Genesis within the first three chapters. Anything else? The what? The promise of the Messiah. Yes, the first three chapters of Genesis. I heard someone to the right. I misheard, okay. What's your name you just came in? Henry. Okay, Henry. And where are you from? Uh, and what are you doing here? Um, studying. What? Comics. Why? <laughs> <laughs> huh? No, you see, God is a God of why. He wants to know why. That's the way God functions. It's not, I committed murder. God wants to know why. Do you understand? I stole some a banana. Why? Because God functions based on the motive first, not the action. It is why you did it. First, not what you did. So Ellen White writes in Christ's Object Lessons, page 316, paragraph 2, every act is judged by the motive. So I come back to you, Professor. Why? It's kind of like the one that opened up for me. Uh -huh. Kind of like I tried some other way, mm -hmm. some other course. Mm -hmm. it's not open up. Do you like commerce? Not really. Okay, all right. Well, whether you like it or not, do well. God is a God of excellence. Okay, some other salvation doctrine. I want you to tell me, so we have the second coming, we have the sanctuary, we have the law of God, we have, what else? Righteousness, Righteousness my faith. Within the first reach, yes, that is the, the spine of the Bible. Something else. What about sin? Right there, the first three chapters. What about righteousness? Right there. What about diet? Right there. What about lifestyle? Right there. What about man-woman relationships? Right there. What about the family? Right there. What about uh, dress and moder mod 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 uh, modest dress? Right there. What about the state of the dead? Right there. You name it and you can find it rooted somewhere in Genesis 1 to 11. Many of them in Genesis 1 to 3. Let's take a look at Jesus' attitude towards Genesis. Go to Luke 17. Luke 17. Welcome, those of you coming in. We are going to Luke 17. While we're doing that, please give us your names. My good brother, what's your name? Lynch. Who? Lynch. 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 Oh, yes, 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 Dr. Lynch. Yes, how are you? <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see you. Welcome, Lynch. Welcome. But Lynch, tell us where you're from. from and what are you studying? Oh, real estate. Real estate. When God made the world, so real estate is right up God's alley. Okay. Study hard, Lynch. And my sister who came in the same time as Lynch. What's your name? Who? Coco? Coco. All right. And where are you from, Coco? And what are you studying? 
Who? Medicine. Biomedicine. Well, all right. Bio means life. Life originates with God. Okay. God bless you. Study hard. God bless you, Lynn. Study hard. What book did I send you to? Luke. What chapter? 17. Let's read from verse 26. Who has the King James Version? All right. Read for us. Listen carefully. And as it was of, uh-huh, so shall it also be. Ah, now, Jesus recognizes Noah as a historical figure. And based on the historicity of Noah and the events around Noah's life, Christ will tell us how to interpret the times that will exist just before he comes as it was in the days of Noah. Then the question you have to ask is what? What was it like in the days of Noah? Jesus Christ tells us, keep reading. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. So Jesus acknowledges the fact that the, there was an era called the days of Noah. And Christ identifies the ordinary events of life. They were eating, they were drinking, which means they had to find a source of food. They were marrying, they were giving in marriage, meaning there were social institutions, there were children, there were schools. The days of Noah was a real time according to Jesus. Keep reading. Keep reading. 27. And they the day that Noah. Uh-huh. What does Jesus Christ regard as a historical event? The flood. Now Christ has been accused of many things, but never of being a liar. People say Christ is not God. People say Christ was just a good man. He was not the Savior. No one ever says Christ is a liar or a bad man. He is never accused of that. Jesus Christ, who declares himself to be the way, the truth, and the life, he said there was a flood. Modern scientists will not accept there was a flood. Some SDA scientists do not accept there was a worldwide flood. They say there was a flood, but wasn't worldwide. Jesus accepts the flood as a historical event, and he takes the flood and the lifestyle just before the flood as the basis to interpret the conditions of the world just before he comes. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered where? So Jesus accepts that someone called Noah did what? Built an ark. Christ says there was an ark. The flood came. People were destroyed. He accepts the destruction of the world by a flood. This is Christ's attitude to the section of the, New Testament, of the Old Testament we'll be looking at. Go to verse 28. Someone else from this side, read for us, please. Luke 17 Verse 28, we're looking at Christ's attitude towards Genesis. Likewise also. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, stop. Now I want you to look at what he said about the days of Noah and what he said about the days of Lot. What are the first two things he says about the days of Noah? Did it eat? Come on. And they? Now, nah. what are the first two things he says about the days of Lot? Did it eat? Did, what is Jesus saying about humanity? They do the same thing. Now they may do it differently, but they do the same thing. Whether you live in a house or under a tree, you need some place to live. Whether you eat fish or you eat tofu, you need a source of food. So Christ is saying, look, what they did in the days of Noah, they did in the days of Lot, and they do today. This morning and I, the pastor went to get something to eat and drink. In other words, humanity is humanity from Garden of Eden. Are you following me? Any questions? Let's keep reading verse 29 of Luke 17. Who read 28? Read 29. Mm -hmm. Stop. What is Jesus saying? The same day that Lot... Now he names Noah by name. He names Lot. He accepts them as historical figures. Now, by saying the same day Lot went out of Sodom, what is Jesus saying? There was a place 
called Sodom. Now, what does the Bible say about Sodom? It was destroyed by fire. Jesus says yes. The same day that Lot went out of Sodom, keep reading, wind and brimstone and now what does that teach us about God? He's what? He's got a power. But what did God do? He destroyed what? Why? Give me one word. Yes, that's a long word. I want a shorter one. But you're right. Sin. God will act against sin. He acted against sin in the days of Noah destructively. He acted against sin in the days of Lot destructively. Now, let's look at the parallel conclusions. What did we conclude from the fact that in the days of Noah, they did eat and drink? In the days of Lot, they did eat and drink. What did we say? People are alike. Now, look at God. In the days of Noah, he destroyed the world. In the days of Lot, he destroyed Lot's world. What does that say about God? What does it say about God? These are hundreds of years between the two events. What does that say about God? He is the same. His reaction to sin is the same. Regardless of the historical era, God will destroy sin. And sinners. I should have asked you to do a few things for me. I won't give number one. <laughs> But number two, while I'm speaking, if you believe in prayer, quietly ask God to put his words in my mouth. Quietly do that. And number th the other thing I want you to do is think. You see, when you think, the Holy Ghost reveals things to you. Don't just read the Bible as though you're on a ski slope. Shh, no. The Bible is a deliberate march. It's not a skiing. Look at where you're stepping. Look. What does this say? Now we said, they did eat and drink, they did eat and drink, Noah, Lot. People are the same. Well, God destroyed the days of Noah, God destroyed the days of Lot, God is the same. His reaction to sin is the same. And so Christ accepted the historicity of the flood. He accepted there was a man called Noah. He accepted that man built an ark. He accepted that only eight people were saved. Let's go to 2 Peter, not 1 Peter. 1 Peter. We look at verse 19 and 20. This is now one of the apostles, the great apostle Peter and his attitude towards the Old Testament. 1 Peter, yes, chapter 3, verse 19 and 20. Anyone who has it, read for us. Read 18 first so you get a bit of a connection. 18. Uh-huh. The just. That he might. Uh-huh. But quickened by. So we have put to death in the flesh because God had to become flesh to die. Divinity can't die. So Christ had to become flesh in order to die. But quickened by the spirit. All right. Now keep the, mind, the word spirit in mind. With spirit on your mind, read 19 now. By which... Mm -hmm. Ah, now, so by the Spirit working through God's people back then, Christ preached to the spirits in prison. Now, some people use that to talk about hell. It's not hell. Keep reading to see what Peter's talking about. Which sometimes were, mm -hmm. waited in the days of Noah. Now, Peter acknowledges Noah as a historical person. But what did Noah do? What was the, the uh, situation? Keep reading. Ah, so Peter says the ark was being built by this man called Noah when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Genesis 6 verse 3 tells us God waited 120 years. So Peter accepts that God waited. He gave the antediluvians 120 years to change. So Peter acknowledges there was a flood. Keep reading. Uh -huh. Ah, Peter acknowledges that only eight people were saved. Just like Christ, 
Peter accepts the events of Genesis as actually having happened. If you remove the historical nature of the events of Genesis 1 to 11, you remove the reality of salvation and the gospel. Are you with me? And so as we embark on a study of Genesis, we are embarking on the study of the most important book in the Bible. Now you may say Revelation and Daniel. No, I say Genesis, but let's not fight over it. But Genesis, and you'll begin to see that as we proceed. Jesus Christ accepted the events in Genesis as actually having happened. Any questions up to this point? Interrupt me anytime you like. This should be an interactive event, not a one-man lecture. Because if I preach, I'll have to pick up an offering. Are you following me? That's the way preachers are. So don't let me preach, let me discuss. Are you following me? All right. Any questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, I remember a few years back, mm -hmm. people they come with the theology that Satan was to bring the destruction, uh -huh. not God. Mm -hmm. His love, mm -hmm. even though it died, mm -hmm. the love is carrying on, mm -hmm. and the people uh, they acknowledge that, and they start God is love, mm -hmm. and he's going to destroy. Mm -hmm. What is the. The Bible. Yeah, okay. Well, let's look at what the Bible says. Let us go back to what Jesus said in Luke 17. Luke 17. Let's read 27 and see what Jesus says about God's response to the sins of the days of Noah. Read verse 27, anyone who has it first. Luke 17, verse 27. Mm-hmm, 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 all right, Jesus said the flood came, the question then becomes the flood came from where, go to Genesis 6, Genesis 6, let's read verse uh, 17 of Genesis 6. Anyone who has it first, read for us. And behold, I, I, even I. Mm -hmm. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who is I? That's a pronoun. We need a noun that goes with a pronoun. Who is I? Who is I? God. What did God say? I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth. Keep reading. To destroy all flesh. Mm hmm. Where even the breath of life. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. God said, I'll bring a flood and destroy the earth. Destruction for sin is God's work. Are you with me? Now, the devil is the instigator of sin. We are the perpetrators of sin, and God executes judgment against sin. God said, I will bring a flood. Now, go to Genesis 19. Let's go to the other event that Christ mentioned, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 19, let's read verse 25 and 26 of Genesis 19. Now, there's a very comfortable couch right up front for those of you who feel too close to the cold air back there. Nice couch, can sit about four people. All right, Genesis 19. 25 and 26, who has that? Read for us. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Now, who overthrew? The Bible says he overthrew. We need to identify, okay, who's he? All right, keep reading. Now, read verse 25. Ah, 24, yes, go ahead. Then the Lord. Mm-hmm. Ah, stop, stop. Wait a minute. Where does God live? When we say the Lord's Prayer, say it for me. Our Father. Yes. Yes, that's where God lives. Does Satan live in heaven? Give me a yes or no. No. Now, read verse 24 again. Mm-hmm. Ah, uh, yes. He reigned it. And we're told the source. 
from heaven. The devil's residence is not heaven. God deliberately sent judgment upon the sinners in the days of Lot as he sent judgment upon the sinners in the days of Noah. God destroys sin. All right. Any other question or comment based on what I've said so far regarding the attitude of Christ and the, 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 the apostles to the events of Genesis? Any questions before I move on? Any comments? Any area that I confused you? All right. Let's go to Genesis 1. Let's look at the size of God. Genesis 1. I was talking to my good pastor, Kojo, as we were coming in, and telling him how I love the fact that God is a personal being. He is not a doctrine. He's not an essence. He's not energy. He is not the universe itself. As some people say, give it to the universe. God is a person, and a personality, an intelligent entity, and one who wants a personal relationship with us. Let's look at the size of God. Genesis 1, verse 1. Someone read for us without looking. Without looking, someone recite Genesis 1.1. Come on, I'm listening. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, permit me to use a marker. Welcome those of you coming in. See if this thing will work. All right, we have... That's how you spell beginning. All right. This is not very, maybe I'll try the black. See, that's a little more. Okay, I'll try black next time. Right, now, listen to Genesis 1. We are looking at the size of God. In the beginning, what word goes with beginning? Think hard before you answer. Yes, yes. Uh, think scientifically. Time. To have a beginning, you must have time. So we have time. If I, you know, time and space were big things to Einstein. Now, we have heaven. What comes to mind when you think of heaven? Think scientifically. Space. What comes to mind when we have earth? Matter. God comes before time, space, and matter. Now, don't ask me to explain how. Because I don't ask a scientist to tell me why I get sick from drinking milk because I can't produce lactase. I don't ask for an explanation. I just avoid milk. You have never seen an enzyme. You accept it. Are you following me? All right. You listen to the Krebs cycle. The teacher explains it. You don't argue. He just accepts it. You believe he knows what he's saying. Now, I don't know how God can predate time, space, and matter. But the God of the Bible is outside. So God created time. God created space. And God created matter. You don't get bigger than that. Which means you can't control God. Nothing is higher than God. Now, that God wants to have a one-to-one -one relationship with you. Hmm. Yes, what, as if no one else exists. The God of time, space, when I say the God of time, space, and matter, the God who predated and created time, space, and matter that occupies so many hours of professional scientists. He wants a one-to-one -one relationship with you. That's the God we're talking about. He's big and he's personal. Now, let's go to Genesis 1, verse 14. We're looking at God. Genesis 1, 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the, keep reading, in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. The Bible says, And God created, God made what? Two great lights, 
The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. Keep reading. He made the stars also. Now, God made all the heavenly bodies. We're looking at how personal a big God is. Go to Psalm 1, go to Isaiah 40 first. Isaiah 40, verse 25, 26. Mr. Cameraman, forgive me for pacing back and forth. I keep stepping out of your frame. Forgive me for ruining your artistic shots. All right. The words? Oh, thank you. Isaiah. Thank you, Lynch. I mean, Bill. Isaiah 40. <laughs> That's Lynch over there. Isaiah 40, verse 25 and verse 26. Information systems. That's our man against the wall. All right. Are we ready? Do we have it? You don't have it yet. I'm a patient man. We have until 5 o'clock. Do you have it now? Amen. And nobody answered the preacher. Do you have it now? Amen. All right. Read with me if you have my version. To whom then will you liken me or shall I be equal? Stop. Pause at that. What is God telling Isaiah to tell the Israelites? There's none. Who do you know is equal to me? You know, I like, the, I like the fact that God tells us, okay, you, you know, God tells us, take me to court and sue me. See if you win the case. <laughs> no, he, he says that in Micah chapter 6, verse 3. He said, testify against me. So God tells Isaiah to tell the Israelites, to whom then will ye liken me or shall I be equal? Then God gives the reason why no one is equal to him. Read verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things? What is God calling you to do tonight? Look into the heavens. Keep reading. That bringeth out their host by number. In other words, God is so big, God knows exactly how many stars there are where. Not just the, the Milky Way, which is our galaxy. Approximately 400 billion stars, and there are billions of galaxies. Now, this is the kind of teaching from the Bible that gives you a concussion, a good concussion. <laughs> God knows exactly how many stars are in the entire universe. Does the Prime Minister know how many people live in Melbourne? He has a rough guess. He doesn't know exactly. Does he know how many members are in your family? No. Is he trying to find out? No. Until voting time comes around, but he doesn't know. God knows. Are you listening to me? God knows how many stars are in the universe. As remarkable as that is, let's look at the creativity of God. Keep reading verse 26. Who bringeth the house by number, he calleth them. Read carefully again. He calleth them. No, there's a word you're not saying. He calleth them all by name. Now, let's stick with our galaxy, the Milky Way. 400 billion stars. Estimate. There's surely more. Now, my mother sometimes forgets what my name is, and she calls me by my brother's name. <laughs> when you're 98, you can do that. Are you following me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. She looks and she says, Brian, no, no, Mom, this is Randy. Okay. Now, God knows exactly the names of every star because he gave the names in the Bible naming is a form of developing a relationship on a one-to-one -one basis with the thing you name so God told Adam name the animals Adam named Eve twice God could have named the animal but because God gave Adam dominion no you named them and established that relationship because you have the dominion you name everyone. God has given a name to, now that's a big God who believes in one-to-one -one relationships. Go to Psalm 147 and we'll read verse 4. Psalm 147, we'll read verse 4. Okay, he telleth the number of the stars. Now, I'll ask for another translation to see what telleth means. Who has a translation other than the King James? Read it for us, the New King James. All right, what does that say? 
Ah, he counts the numbers of the stars. Keep reading. Yes. So we have a repetition of Isaiah 40, 26. God counts the number of the stars now. Here's how God's one way he separates himself from human beings. He loves them, but he wants them to know, compared to me, you're nothing. Go to Genesis 15. We're still looking at the bigness of God. When uh, entertainment people like superstars, they have bodyguards. Are the bodyguards small people? Have you ever seen bodyguards? Are they small people? No. They're big men. You need to know who your spiritual bodyguard is. How big he is. And his muscles. Where did I send you? Now, let's read for verse 1. You never lose by reading the Bible. Now, God is talking to Abraham. Read from verse 1. From verse 1 of Genesis 15. After these things, Lord came unto in a vision saying, Fear not, Abram, I and thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Pause a minute. Those words apply not only to Abram, but to you. Let me, I'll be, doing, I'll be digressing a lot. I'll veer off the main track and say things I think the Holy Ghost wants me to say. Read those words again and take them personally. Read the first verse of Genesis 15 again. Uh huh. I am. Come on. Uh huh. Now, God says to Abraham, I am two things to you. I am two things to you. I am your shield. I'm your great reward. What does a shield do? It protects. What does a reward do? Yeah, yeah, motivates, yes. But something more material than motivation. Are you rewarded for your work? Aren't you rewarded for your work? How? Australian dollars. Okay. So, okay, you're rewarded. Now, God says, I am your reward. Now, why did God say that? In Genesis 14, all right, we have some of God's people coming in. There's some seats right up front. They're the nicest seats. Nicest seats. Let's get rid of the teddy bears who are not listening. And uh, we'll uh, make room for those who are listening. Okay. <laughs> Okay, all right, there goes a young prophet, okay. All right, there we are. Good, good, good. Anybody else? Let me take this off while we're, well, we leave it up. All right. My young brother Joseph, hi, come on in, come on in, come on in. <laughs> right over there next to your little friend. All right. This is my host family just coming in. I, I don't look like them, but they are my family. Are you with me? Because we look alike right here. Can you say amen? All right. Okay. All right. Now, where are we reading? Genesis 15. We read one. And after these things, the, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, Fear not Abram. Not Abraham. Abram. He became Abraham in Genesis 17.5. Fear not Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now, why does God say, I am your exceeding great reward? In chapter 14, Abraham fought a battle to deliver Lot from captivity. Are you following me? Go to chapter 14 quickly. Let's read verse 12 of Genesis 14. Anyone read nice and loud? Anyone read, don't be afraid. They also took Lot. They also took Lot, uh-huh. Uh-huh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Right. Now, there were some invading kings from the other side of the Euphrates River. They came in. They fought a battle because the, uh, the, the, the towns on the plains of Jordan, of Sodom, they were under the control of a Mesopotamian king. When they rebelled, the king came in with some associates to punish them and to, you know, let them know, wait, wait a minute, no, you're under my control. So they, they came, they conquered the cities, they conquered Sodom, Lot was in Sodom, they took Lot, and they went off. Now, let's go to verse 13. Come on, somebody read, don't take long. Yeah, you see, somebody escaped that battle, you see, and told what? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mamre, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and Rudd of, mm-hmm, uh-huh, confederate with Abraham. So Abraham had a working relationship with the surrounding tribes. They respected him as a prince because he was. Listen to verse 14. And when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, stop. What was the biological relationship of Abraham and Lot? Abraham was the uncle, Lot was the nephew. What does the Bible say in verse 14? Brother, now let me say quickly, spiritually, we don't have uncles and aunts. We have brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers. Do you know your wife is your sister spiritually? Because God is your father. Spiritually, yes. It makes a difference in how you treat one another. Your wife, spiritually, is your sister. <laughs> Because God is your father. Anyway, verse 14, when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, keep reading, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318 and unto now. So Abraham goes chasing these four com armies combined as one. But when God is with you, there's no force that can oppose you and succeed. So Abraham goes and he conquers them. Read verse 16. He brought back all the goods uh, and his goods, the women also, and the people. So Abraham wins a tremendous victory, brings back all the captive people who had been taken from Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Bela, the cities of the plain. There were five of them. He brings them back. Now, read verse uh, 10. Come on, read, read, read. And the veil of Sodom was full of slime pits, uh-huh. And Gomorrah fled, and when the battle started, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah ran from the battle. And they went hiding in this place which was full of pits and caves. And Abraham, of course, fought and won. Now, Abraham has won. He has come back. <laughs> now, the king of Sodom crawls out of his hole. Read verse 17. Uh-huh. Meet Abram after his return from the slaughter of Kedoleoma. And the kings that were with him, come on, in the valley of Shavi, which is the king's dale. Now that Abraham has won, the king comes out of his hole where he was hiding, and he comes to congratulate Abraham. Go to verse 21. This is the same king. King of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. Now stop. Look at 16 again. And he brought back all the what? All that the armies had stolen, the precious things, because armies don't steal useless things, Abraham brought back. So he came back with a lot of what? Stuff. stuff. Give me a nicer word than stuff. Give me a nicer word than goods. Treasure. He came back with treasure. And treasure attracts everybody, including cowards. So the king of Sodom came out of his hole. <laughs> he said, now Abraham, let's talk. You keep the money, but give me my people so I can repopulate my city. Remember, they took all the inhabitants. Read verse 12 again. Read 11 and 12. 11 and 12. Of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh-huh. Uh-huh. And went their way. Verse 12. Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, uh-huh, and his goods. But clearly, they also took the people. That was the custom back then. Repopulate, re uh, transplant the people so they cease to be a threat. The king comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, can I have my people back? Why is he begging Abraham? Abraham, was, he had the upper hand. He won the war. 
So the king had to beg. He begs, and he says, you keep the stuff, give me the people. Here is what Abraham says, then we'll understand verse 1 of chapter 15. Read verse 22 and verse 23. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread, even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say, I have made Abraham right. Abraham said, I am taking nothing from you. So Abraham won the battle, but lost the money. Now, God sees Abraham and his righteous behavior. Listen now to verse 1 of chapter 15. Read out loud. After these things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fear not, Abraham. I am thy shield and thy... Mm-hmm. You gave up the money, the gold, the silver. I am a reward more valuable than that. Now, all this, I digress from... God knowing how many stars they are. I just want to give you background. Keep reading now. Let's go to verse 2. Said, Lord God, give me, seeing I go childless. Uh huh. Steward of my house is this. Abraham wants a child. He doesn't want money. He wants a child. Verse 3. Behold, no seed, yeah, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. He wants a child. Listen to God in verse 4. The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Now, carefully. Now, let's read Psalm 147, verse 4 again. Then we'll go read verse 15 of Genesis 15. Psalm 147, verse 4 again. We're still looking at the bigness of God. All right, Psalm 147, verse 4. He telleth the number of the stars, he calleth them by name. And we read from the other version, telleth means to count. And I was about to tell you how God is separating himself from puny human beings, even though he loves them. Now let's read verse 5, 5 of Genesis 15. Keeping in mind, telleth means to count. He brought him forth abroad, that's Abraham, mm -hmm, and said, Look now toward heaven, uh huh. Stop. Read that differently. Look now towards heaven and count the stars. Keep reading. If thou be able to number them. Now stop. Let me take this off the board. Let me show you the bigness of God. You see, God never wants us to forget how big he is. And how small we are compared to him. So we have God can count stars. Now. Abraham, finish that sentence, cannot count stars, count stars. Even though God wants a one-to-one -one relationship, God wants, do not forget how big I am. Because the moment you do that, you see, if you're walking along with someone, you don't know he's the Prime Minister of Australia. He's dressed like you. You're walking along. You may become a little disrespectful or casual until you discover this is the Prime Minister. Then your behavior changes. Are you following me? You're walking on campus. You see a man in white hair, uh, sneakers, and he just comes from jogging. And you walk in and say, who are you? Uh, then you realize he is the chairman of your PhD dissertation. Everything changes. Everything changes. So God wants, reminds us, look, the difference between this person and that person cannot be counted. I can count the stars. You can't. But I love you. I want to be one-on-one -on -one with you. But do not forget how big I am. I know every star by name. Let's see the bigness of God again. Go to... Uh, Matthew 10, I believe it's Matthew 10, read verse 29, Matthew 10, 29, what does that say? Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, come on, one of them, 
Uh huh. Now wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's. Uh, let me do this before I go any further. I've gone too far without doing it. Actually, let's pray again. Loving Father in heaven, I've spoken too much without seeking more spiritual help. Forgive me for that. I humble myself before you. Put your words in my mouth. You tell me what to emphasize and stress. Let me seek to glorify you, not me. Bless your beloved people whom you love so much. As we learn of you, dear God, let that draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What was I saying? Matthew 10. What did Matthew 10 say? Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing. Now, what is a farthing for those of you in the British system? You know what a farthing is? We no longer have, well not we, Britain no longer has farthings. A farthing is insignificant. In the United States, you go to a gas station, you buy gas or petrol. And there's a little, almost every gas station or little convenience store, they have a little dish on the counter next to the cashier. You know what they put in there? Pennies. Nobody wants them. So you get the change, you see a penny, you drop it in there. You go to any supermarket parking lot, any gap, you see a penny on the ground. No one will be seen dead picking up a penny. I don't pick up pennies. You pick up $20, but not a penny. Now, Jesus says, sparrows are so insignificant, you can buy two for a penny. But finish the verse. Now one of them shall fall on the ground. God is aware when one sparrow dies. Let me tell you about a bird in East Africa. It's called the red bill quilia. They exist on the east, the plains of East Africa by the millions. That bird, the chicken spends the shortest amount of time in the egg. Just 10 days. It comes out. So they reproduce very, very rapidly. Of course, they die by the hundreds. Every time one dies, finish my words. God knows. The God of time, space, and matter. The God who counts every star, who names every star, he's aware when one insignificant bird drops dead. That God wants a relationship with you. I've spent all this time to present to you a big God who loves you. Now, any questions before I move to another part of that God? Okay. We said, by the way, those of you who just came in, we're looking at Genesis and the very great importance of Genesis, as, as far as the Bible is concerned, space, time, what's the third one? Matter. God made them. In the beginning, that's time, God created the heavens, that's space, and the earth, that's matter. Now, uh, if you saw something spectacular made by a man or woman, you look at it, you're amazed down to the, your socks. What question do you tend to ask? Okay, why is one question? What's the other question though that comes first? How did you do that? As the pastor and I were coming in, there was a man juggling at the corner of the street, raising money. He's juggling two whatever little things, and there's a ball. He's juggling this stuff. And I'm looking at him. I told the pastor, if he could apply that time to Bible study, he could be the Pope. He, he, he just all that time to practice this thing. But I prefer him to do that than commit crimes. Are you following me? And so my question was, how does he do that? Now you look at space. Time and matter. And what do you say? Come on. How did he do that? How? You say, okay, I accept you exist. But how do you create space? How do you create time? And how do you create matter? How? Let's go to Genesis 1. We'll read from verse 1. Genesis 1, verse 1. It is now six minutes after 2. Those of you who have classes or study sessions or whatever you may have, six after 2.
Genesis 1 from verse 1, read with me. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now we stop. We're looking at how he did it. Verse 1 tells us what he did and who did it, God. Verse 2 begins to tell us, introduces us to how he did it. Verse 2 says, and the earth was without form and void. What does that mean? There are two Hebrew words, tohu and bohu. The earth was without form, it was chaotic. Void, it was barren. So when God created matter, here's just matter, but void, barren, nothing. Go to Jeremiah 4, let's read verse 23. Jeremiah 4, verse 23. Jeremiah 4, 23. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. Because his message was to warn Jerusalem, destruction is coming. Do not oppose the Babylonians. They did not listen and they paid a terrible price. Let me tell you something. Disobedience to God comes with a terrible price. You either pay it now or you pay it later, but you pay it. Jeremiah 4, someone read verse 23 for me. I beheld the earth, earth uh-huh. And lo, without form, was void and? No, read again. I beheld the earth and lo, it was? And? Now, same thing as Genesis 1-2. What Jeremiah is seeing is the earth, after Christ comes back, takes the redeemed with him, and the earth is destroyed by the coming of Christ. Everything is chaotic. All human beings are dead. That's what Jeremiah... Read verse 24. Uh-huh. Yes, because when Christ comes, there'll be chaos. Mountains will collapse. Islands will disappear. That's what Jeremiah is seeing. Read verse 25. Uh-huh. No man, uh-huh. Nothing living. He is seeing a vision of the world between the coming of Christ and the end of the millennium. That's what he's seeing. Now, you take that, you throw it back to Genesis 1-2. And the earth was without form and void. Chaos, emptiness, barren. Now, so what we have in Genesis 1-2, give me one word for Genesis 1-2. What do we have there? It starts with a D. Then an I, then an S, disorder. That's what we have in Genesis. Let me take this off. We have disorder. That's a condition of matter after God made matter, disorder. Now I have a question for you. We have an earth with a sun, moon, Stars in its, in its, you know, the, the immediate part of heaven connected to the earth. We have trees, Genesis 1.11. We have animals, Genesis 1.23 to 25. We have, uh, we have uh, water. We have dry land, Genesis 1.9 uh, to uh, 10. We have fish, Genesis 1.20-21. We have birds. Now we have an organized ecosystem. Are you following me? But in verse 2, we had what? And no life. Because Jeremiah helps us understand the conditions of Genesis 1-2. The birds were gone. There were no human beings. Nothing alive. How did such an organized ecosystem come out of this disorder? Let me ask you a question. Don't answer me, but listen. Uh, is this sometimes disorder in your life? In your family? God, what do I do? Is there disorder in society? We have disorder on the highest scale. My question is, how did God bring about a vibrant living system with animals, plants, people, clean air, fresh water, grass, birds, flowers, out of this. Let's go chapter th verse 3 of Genesis 1. Someone read for me verse 3. How does that start? 
And God said, stop. Look at verse 6. Come on, read nice and loud. And God said. Look at verse uh, 8 or 9. And God said. Look at 11. Look at 14. Look at 20. Look at 24. All right, answer the question now. How did God bring order out of disorder? His word. His word, yes, his word. Where is his word? You say in his mouth. Well, fine, but here it is. You don't look impressed with God's word. <laughs> Listen to me carefully. The major lesson of Genesis 1 is not to tell us first and foremost in what order things were made. The major lesson of Genesis 1, which Christ accepted as historical, is the power of the word of God. Not the word of Socrates, or the word of Mohandas Gandhi, or the word of Mother Teresa, or the word of Pope whomever. The word, not my word, the word of God. Nothing will bring order into your life like living by the word of God. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Let's go back before day one. Genesis 1, and in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. How did God create time? By his word. How did God create space? By his word. How did God create matter? By his word. Let me make a statement you may find shocking or Hard to believe. Nothing is more important to God than his word. The reputation of God for being faithful is based on the fact that he always keeps, come on, his word. We are introduced to the power of this word in Genesis 1. When you apply for a job, what does your employer want on a piece of paper? What's, what do we call that piece of paper you present while typed in on nice paper with perfume on it? What is it called? A curriculum vitae? What do you call it? Resume? A CV. All right. Why are you submitting a CV? He wants to know what you can do. And you want to tell the employer, your potential employer, here's what I have done and how I have done it. Some of it is a lie, but it makes you look good. So here is, here is what I have done, and here's how I did it. You see, I was a manager at McDonald's or whatever you were, and you say, I hear this. And the employer reads it, and he, oh, he's impressed, and he hires you. Above all other people who submitted CVs, he hires you because yours is more impressive. Because he now believes that if he can acquire that skill into his company, he'll be benefited. God wanted work. He wanted to serve as savior. So God came to the world and said, look, I want to be hired as your savior. There's another applicant called the devil. <laughs> but look at my CV. Look at what I did. And how I did it. And so, you know, we read him, okay, he made heaven, he made earth, space, time, matter, he made grass, he made trees, he made the seas, dry land, he made the birds, the fish, the land animals, he made people. How did he do that? How did he do that? Now, God watches us as we read his resume. <laughs> He's watching us. Let me see if after reading this resume, they can hire somebody else. How do you read God's resume in Genesis 1 and hire someone else? Who's the other person? The devil. Because he, his resume is destruction, murder, deceit, sickness, disease. 
Do you understand now why to disobey or disbelieve God's word is the greatest crime against God? Go to Psalm 138. Psalm 138. And let me say, as you're looking for Psalm, God bless you for loving his word. I really mean that. We live in a world that's so busy that people have little time for God's word, including Christians. And may God bless you, your family, your lives, because you love his word. The safest life to live is a life lived in accordance with God's word. Believe me. Psalm 138, someone read verse 2. We're looking at God's word. Thy, uh-huh. What is thy name for thy, and for thy, carefully now the last part of that verse. Magnify thy word, come on, above all thy name. The Bible has approximately 300 names for God. God said you take them all together and my word is above them. Let me pause. Questions or comments based on what I've said. Don't take me away in some other area. Whom did Cain marry? No, just on what I've said so our minds are not distracted. On what I've said. Questions, comments. Not, no, no, no much difference. It's the same person. That's a very good question, sister. God bless you for that. Let's go to John 1.1. 1, 1. Thank you so much. God bless you. Also, 1 John, by the way, we'll go there as well. 1 John chapter 1. Let's now, we're going to John 1, then we go to 1 John 1. We put up beginning right here. All right. Now, as you look at John 1, 1, listen to Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, let's read John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was with God. Now, it's the same beginning, but let's see if we have evidence for that. Verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things were what? Made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And so we have beginning in verse 1, we have creation in verse 3. So in the, the person in John 1.1 1, 1 is the same person in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, or 1.3, 1, who said, let there be light. Go to 1 John, written by the same person. Chapter 1, we'll read from verse 1. 1 John chapter 1, we'll read from verse 1, is John 1.1, 1, 1, and uh, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, are they related? Are they talking about the same beginning? The answer is yes. Now let's look at another book by John. 1 John 1, reading from verse 1. Who has that? Read for me. That which was from the... Uh -huh, keep reading. Which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Now stop. Now, listen again. That which was from the... Beginning. Now, the word that may throw you off. You may think John is writing about something. He's writing about somebody. That which was from the beginning. Genesis 1 1, John 1, now 1 John 1. Which we have heard, which we have seen, which our eyes have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. The word of life is a term for the person we've seen. That's Christ. Because you go back to John, the Gospel John, this is the verse 14. Let's read from verse 1 again, then we'll skip to 14, then we'll see what 1 John is trying to tell us. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We have two people I've mentioned there. The same was in the beginning with God. The same refers to that person, the Word. Verse 3, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. By the way, look at verse 1, 2, and 3 again. Now, I want you to think. Look at it microscopically and discover a tremendous truth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And so we have the Word, and the Word was with God. So we have a relationship. You don't have a relationship with one thing. You have it with two. That's why we have prepositions. He's on, behind, in front, or whatever. Relationship. They're together. In the beginning was the Word. The word was with God. The same, this is the word, just referred to differently, was in the beginning with God. We have two people again. 
But now we have the word was God, that's equality. The word was with God, that's plurality. Two people, but they're equal, but not the same. Now, listen to verse 3. All things were made by, say it again, all things were made by him. How is this him significant? How many people are in verse 1? How many people in verse 2? What pronoun is used in verse 3? Him. Singular. But how many do we have? Two, plural. Which means that one of the two did what? One of the two did what? Created. Are you with me? One person said yes. What about the rest of you? Listen, look again microscopically. We have two people. We have two again. Verse 3 could have said, all things were made by them. That's not what it says. It says by him. Go to verse 4. Well, go to verse 3. In him was, verse 4, in him was, and the life was the light of. So this word or this same, he naturally has life. Life originates with him. But since they are equal and the word was God, then the same can be said of him. Are you following me? Because they're equal. Now, in him was life. The life was light of men. Go to verse 10. We still have him. Verse 10. He was in the world. Uh -huh. The world was made by him, and the world knew he. We have him not. We have singular again. Now, of the two of them, one came to the world. Now, which one? Go to verse, two. verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Now, who rejected Christ, the Romans or the Jews? The Jews. So, oh, he was in the world. No, he came unto his own. Ah, who rejected him? The Jews. Now read verse 14. Ah, where do we first find the word? In verse 1. The word is called the same in verse 2. He is the creator in verse 3. He's the creator in verse 10. He's rejected in verse 11. More information is given. He came in flesh. Ah, who are we talking about? Jesus who was in the beginning. He is as much God as is the Father. Jesus. So the person who said, let there be light, was whom? Jesus. He wasn't called Jesus then. That's the creator. So when I said, God is a big God, he made space, he made time, he made matter, who am I talking about? Jesus. But we know the Father is equal with him. The man who died on Calvary created time, space, and matter. Now you tell me, which is more difficult for him, creating a universe or saving you from smoking? What's, more what's, what's easier, delivering you from smoking? Ah, come on, I lost you. You're not listening. Am I talking to myself? Now, let's go to 1 John 1 now. 1 John 1. When you found it, let me know by saying amen. Read with me. That which was from the, which we have. Now stop. John is saying, I personally heard the voice of the one who made space, time, and matter. I heard him. What a privilege. I heard him. Not via the internet. I was standing right next to him. That which we have heard. Keep reading. Which we have seen with our eyes. I saw him. Keep reading. Which we have looked upon. I looked at the one who said, let there be light. Keep reading. And our hands have handled of the word of life. What does he mean by our hands have handled? What is he saying about God or Christ? This person who made space, time, and matter, John is saying, I handled him. All right, I'm going to stand by this table. Handle me. Be quicker than that. Handle me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What is he saying about Jesus? He came flesh and blood. We handle him. The one who created of the word of life. Read verse 2 of 1 John 1. For the life was, 
Now, is the word life capitalized in your Bible? It's not capitalized. All right. But it refers to whom? Jesus Christ. For the life was manifested, come on, and we have seen it and bear witness, come on, and that eternal life, come on, which was, ah, with the Father. What does John 1, 1 say? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. What does verse 4 say? In Him was life. So what was with God? Life. That life which was with the Father. Do you notice how, we're, how I'm leading you in the Bible study? What am I doing? What am I doing as I try to explain the Bible to you? Verse here, come on. A verse there. That's how to study the Bible. A lot of, we have a lot of churches with all kinds of theology based on the same Bible because they study differently. People believe you can eat anything because they build that on one verse. But the Bible tells us how to study. Here a little, there a little, line upon line. And when you do that, things come to you and you're just amazed at how God wants us to know. Let me pause at uh, 2.30, just about, 2.27. Based on all I've said from 1 o'clock to 2.30, that's a long time to talk. But in China, you go from 9 in the morning to 9 in the evening, so <laughs> that's okay. All right, now, think of all I've said, think. Very important thing, when you think you're acting like God, when you think about the right things, of course. Ask me a question or say something. Give a testimony. Yes. The word, yes. yes. That means the whole Bible is the word of God. Thus saith the Lord is God's word. That's one way the word is introduced. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. Well, the word of God has power. To give life, to heal, to save above everything else, to create. That's the word of God. The Bible, we're told, is God's divine word. Some parts of the Bible tell us how to handle our money. Some parts tell us how to handle our families. Some tell us how to handle our enemies. Some tell us how to handle disputes. Now, the part that tells you how to handle disputes is not the part that tells you how to, to, to raise the dead or how to heal the sick. So different parts of the Word of God will do different things, but the Word of God overall is powerful, and from Genesis to Revelation is God's Word. God's Word is not really the pronouns and the nouns. It is what the Word expresses. It's what it says. Not just, you see, here's how I can explain that to you. J-E-S-U-S, -S, what is that? But if you're in Argentina or some Hispanic country, what is it? Jesus. Jesus. Now, is there saving power in Jesus? No. Is there saving power in Jesus? Yes. The power is not in J-E-S-U-S. -S. It is in what that stands for. The one who said, let thee be light. The one who said, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave. That's the word of God, not just letters on a page. You see, you can burn this. It's, it's physical paper with ink. That's not the word of God. What it expresses, that because the word of God liveth and abideth forever. You can't burn it, but you can burn paper. All right. Good question. Thank you. God bless you. Someone else, say something. Think. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. What do you understand by magnify? Someone read another version. Let's see if we can get some light. Psalm 138, verse 2. We're looking at magnify. When you magnify something, what you do? You make it bigger. You give it a place of prominence. You magnify. Now, any other translation for magnify? Hmm? Exalted, is that what your version says? So read it for us. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, all right. Exalted is one. Magnify. To give a place of prominence and preeminence. God's word is above his name. Because his name was built on his faithfulness to his word. Someone else. And as you listen, ask yourself, how does this apply to me as an individual? What difference will this make in my life? As I struggle from day to day to make a living and to survive in this country, what difference does it make to me to know that God's word has that power? And that there's a God who's so big who wants to have a relationship with me. What does it mean to me as a person as I struggle through biochemical engineering or commerce or law or whatever? What has, how does this benefit me? Because God always starts with the individual. Any questions, any comments? Okay, what have we said so far about God? Tell me. He wants a one-to-one -one relationship. Now that's God, that's you. All right. Tell me about you. Small, good word. Yeah, small, real small. Tell me about you. Very good. Small. Mm -hmm. We what? Hmm? Can't count the stars. That's how small we are. Our mind is like a peanut. Okay, go on. We're dirt. <laughs> You're dirt. Don't smile when you say that. That's serious. You're dirt. Okay. <laughs> what else can you say about you? All right. Let's leave you. God, come on. Tell me. Big. Big. Huh? Come on. Righteous. Always right. Something is about God based on what you said. He turns disorder into order. How? Can you do the same thing in your life? Yes. Some people lead chaotic lives. I mean chaos. A sense of order, reliability, consistency. God will do it if you accept his word. Tell me something else about God. Nothing is more important, than God. Nothing is more important to God than his word. Jesus takes as a name the word of God. Go to Revelation 19. And remember, we're still dealing with Genesis. We can take the rest of the year to deal with Genesis. In Revelation 19, this is a vision John sees of Christ coming back to destroy the wicked and take his people home. Here's how the Bible describes him. John 19, uh, Revelation 19, written by John, of course, but Revelation 19. Read verse 13. Quickly. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Come on. And his name is called the Word of God. Mm -hmm. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. It, God. Christ has as a name the Word. John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the light. But what is the truth? John 17.17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy Word is truth. Jesus says, I am the Word. He picks the word and makes it his name. This. Now, what's the only way to please God? Faith. Without faith, come on, tell me. It's impossible to please. What is faith? Your, your response or your relationship to what he says. Your reaction to the fact that he made space, time, and matter by the word, your reaction to that, that's faith. Your trust in God's word. Total trust. You lean your entire weight, your entire being, mind, body, soul, spirit, you place on God's word. Anything else you have heard or has affected you this morning before I move on? We're all focusing in Genesis. All right, let's look at something else. By the way, do you need a break for five minutes to go and pray? And say hallelujah. No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so can I just go on? All right. Okay. When I asked earlier, what are some of the major doctrines that come out of Genesis? Someone said the commandments of God. Now, let's go to Genesis 2. Let's make a switch. We can never finish talking about the, the bigness of God, but we have to move on and God understands. 
Genesis 2, we'll read from verse 16. We're in Genesis. Now, I don't drink water when I'm in church preaching, but you don't mind if I sip all this talking. All right, thank you for being so nice. What book did I say? What chapter? From what verse? Someone read for us, please. Commanded the man, saying, uh huh. Freely eat, uh huh. Come on, go on. But of the tree of the knowledge, uh huh. Mm hmm. Okay. Okay. What do we have here? A commandment. God commanded the man. But let's use the exact word. All right. He commanded the man saying, this is my command. Don't do that. Do that. We know what happened. He disobeyed. Go to verse uh, 11. Go to 9 of chapter 3. Genesis 3. Let's read from verse 9. Start for me. Lord God called unto Adam, said unto him, where art thou? Keep reading. And he said, uh-huh. And I was afraid. Uh-huh. Keep going. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? So God is saying, Did you do what I told you, come on, not to do? What do you call that? Disobey. Did you disobey? So we have command again. Go to verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Hearken unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Now, we have command again. We have Genesis. 317. We're looking at commandment now in Genesis. Command, command, command. Read verse 17 again and think. Read microscopically and tell me what you conclude. And unto Adam he said, Come on, read. Because thou hast hearkened now. What does the word because bring to, to mind? The cause. The cause, uh-huh, the reason. Yes, okay, I'm looking for a word that starts with a C. Consequence, sister. What's the name? Felita. Cons there are consequences for what? Disobedience. And God is saying it's because you disobeyed. What was the consequence? Let's read the whole verse without interruption. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, finish it. Cursed is the ground. What is the consequence of violating God's commandments? A curse. Without variation. But who brought the curse? I didn't say who inflicted it. Who brought it really? Adam brought it on himself. How? By disobeying. No, Adam didn't curse the ground. God cursed it. But the reason God cursed it was because of what Adam did. So in that sense, he brought it on himself. If your professor tells you the exam is at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Anyone who's late will not be allowed to sit the exam, and you show up at 4.30 and you fail, you failed yourself. Now, it is he that writes fail on the paper. It is he that writes fail on your, and then mails you your grade card, but you essentially failed yourself. Command, command, command. Having read what we read, 
what is the reason the world is suffering today? We don't obey God. Simple. We don't obey. We always have a better idea for God. Because we have graduate degrees. Father, listen to me. You never graduated from university. Listen to me. You say the seventh day the Sabbath. How about Sunday? I did research. And I published my results in a peer-reviewed magazine. Sunday. And what about whatever? Contrary to what God has said. We are suffering because God's command was violated. So we have the importance of obeying God's command in the Garden of Eden. But before we get to obeying God's command, Adam and Eve, let's look at God's command operating again. But before we get into that, let me pray again. Father, as I enter a very, very sensitive area, you tell me what to say as I restrain self with your help. Please, you tell me what to say so that you may be glorified and your blessed people blessed. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, Think with me. Go to Genesis 1-3. Genesis 1-3. Do you have that? Read for me now. I'll let you read. I'll keep quiet. Uh-huh. Stop. Stop. Say that again. All right. Let's, uh, okay. We leave command on there. We'll put... Let there be light. All right. How many words are those? Four words. Let there be light. Go to 2 Corinthians 4. We're looking at commandment in Genesis. Long before the law was given on Sinai, we're looking at law commandment in Genesis. It's a quarter to three. Are you in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4? Read with me. What does it say? No, sorry, sorry. Verse 6, verse 6, verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 4. Just go two verses down. Read for me now. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. Stop. Well, finish the verse. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to look at that verse very carefully. <laughs> All right. Take a pause, deep breath. Look at verse 6 again. And look at what's written on the board on the right side. My right side, your left. Read out loud. No, read quietly, microscopically. And then look at the words written on the right side, your left. And tell me what you, what you see. Yeah, if you see command. Now, tell me what you see. Yeah, light shining out. Okay, true. Keep going. Mm -hmm. But look at 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Then look at Genesis 1, 3. The first four words. Oh, these four words. All right, let me help you. Watch this. Read that for me. If you're taking an English class, what do you call that? Uh, it's a sentence. Am I right? Is it a sentence in Australia? Yes, this is a sentence. His name is John. Are you with me? All right, now, take this off. What's that? It's a command. Why do you say that? Yes, but why do you say that? I gave you two verses. 
Look at the Bible. Don't come up with your own genius. I'm glad you have it. But look at the Bible. Read verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 4. For God who commanded the light to shine. Now, how did he command the light? What did he say? Let there be light. What is this? A command. Which means before we have God giving Adam a command, don't eat that tree, we have commands being used to do what? Create. Ah, I'm talking to myself. Are you following me? So if you get rid of command, what do you get rid of? Creation. Creation. The devil's target is the law of God. He hates commandments. Because commandments are the foundation of God's entire throne. Now, let me ask you this as we think. You know, with computers now, nobody, we can't write anymore. Our handwriting is terrible. But nobody uses a pen. All right, so please forgive me. Now, let's be consistent. What is this? What is that? A command. Then what is this? A command. Now, you go on and tell me something else. Go through Genesis 1, identify another command, and give me the verse. Come on, you're too slow. Come on. I, yet the water under the heavens be gathered together. What verse is that? Verse 9. What is that? A command. Come on, give me another command. Let the waters bring forth abundantly, or verse 20, or verse 11. Let the earth bring forth grass. Now, what is that? A command. Now, stop. You can look up. How was light made? By command. The Bible says. Then how was the firmament made? By command. Not suggestion. Listen carefully to what I have to say to you. I believe the Holy Spirit wants me to tell you. What are the very first words spoken as far as the Bible tells us? Read the words. The very first word spoken according to the Bible. Let it be light. What's that? Then give me a conclusion. The very first words spoken was a command. Now, let the Bible tell you the natural state of our minds because of sin. Don't look, just listen. Are you listening? Look up and listen. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. Sin has made us opposite to a system brought into existence. How? By command. So the whole universe travels in this direction, the direction of command. Sin has us traveling this way. With all our degrees and our big houses and fancy cars and bank accounts the size of Fort Knox, we're still traveling in this direction. And the universe is going how? In this direction. In which direction is God going? The direction of the universe because the universe follows him. We're headed this way. Which means that sin puts us out of harmony. Finish my words. With what moves this way? The universe. Sin puts us out of harmony with the universe. How do we get back into harmony with the, how do we turn and move with the universe and God? We repent and we start to do what? Obey.
Now, when Jesus says, come now, let us reason together. We need to lay aside culture, custom, tradition. Let's reason through, thus saith the Lord. Let me tell you a secret and publicize the secret. When you read the Bible honestly, something will change in your life. Don't read the Bible from a feminist perspective or black power perspective or freedom for the aborigines perspective. Mm, read it from the perspective of God's love for us and his desire to save us from sin. You know what the problem of the aborigine is? Tell me. Only three letters in the word. Sin. What's the problem of the native Indians in the United States? What's the problem of uh, you know, the Filipinos? <laughs> What's the problem of the Malaysians? What's the solution for the black people? No, not sin. Christ. <laughs> no, not sin. <laughs> Obey. <laughs> Are you with me? Where do we first come across commandment? Genesis 1-3. Not Mount Sinai. The concept of command and obedience is introduced in Genesis 1-3. Now, I said the concept of what? And now the concept of command and obedience is found in Genesis 1-3. Where is obedience found in Genesis 1-3? And there was light. Now, you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, preacher, wait a minute. How do you get to that conclusion? How can light obey God? Go to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Do you have Mark? Mark is the shortest of the four Gospels. Mark was not one of the 12 disciples, neither was Luke. Oh, verse, ah, thank you. Verse 37. That's Brother Bill. Verse 37 of Mark 4. Now, I want you to read microscopically. Read closely. When you found it, say amen. Read with me. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they wake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Now, verse 39, read for me. And he arose, come on, and rebuke the wind. Stop. Stop, 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 stop. Rebuked the wind, and he arose and rebuked the wind. Keep going. And said unto the sea, stop. Keep going. Peace be still. Stop. Keep reading now. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And so we have wind over here. We have the wind ceased. And for the sea, which is over here, we have a great calm. All right. Are we still with God's word, yes or no? All right. Have I introduced my opinions yet? Not yet. All right. Listen carefully to the word of God. He arose and rebuked the wind. Here's how reasoning is necessary for Bible study. Does the Bible tell us exactly what he told the wind? No. Does it tell us what he told the sea? Yes. What did he tell the sea? But is that a rebuke? Come on. 
Yes. Peace be still. There's a rebuke. So while we don't have the words of the rebuke to the wind, we know he said something to the wind. How do we know the wind obeyed? The wind ceased. The Bible says the wind ceased. Why did the wind cease? He said something to it. There was a great calm. Why? He told the sea, peace be still. What did the wind do? Come on. It ceased, but give me another word. It obeyed. What did the sea do? Now, let the Bible say it more clearly than I can. Read verse 41. And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this? Finish the verse. That even the wind and the sea obey him. Now, you can only obey a command. You don't obey a suggestion. Because there's no burden to obey a suggestion. I'm talking too quickly. Let me slow down. <laughs> Bill said him. <laughs> Listen to me carefully. You do not have to obey a suggestion. A suggestion is up to you. A command gives you no choice if you want to please God. This was a command. The wind obeyed. This was a command. The sea obeyed. Now, I am selling you this to show you if the wind can obey and sea can obey, can light obey? Why did you take so long to answer? Yes. Does it have to be a living thing to obey? No. That's the power of God's command and God himself, that non-living things also obey God. Go to Isaiah 5. Isaiah 5 is just about 3 o'clock. And we'll read from verse 1. We'll read several verses so you get the connection as to why God says what he says in verse uh, 6. John, Isaiah 5, someone read from verse 1, please. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. Keep reading. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof. Come on. Planted it with the choicest vine. Come on. Built a tower in the midst of it and also made a winepress therein. Keep reading. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and brought it forth wild grapes. Verse 3. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah. Keep reading. Judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been what? Come on. Done more to my vineyard that I have not done it. In other words, God is saying, what else could I do to save you? That's, that's another study altogether. Wherefore, when I look, keep reading, that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild. Now, God is saying, look, because you didn't do what I said, now I'm going to exercise judgment on you. Verse 5 now. And now go to... I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will do what? Take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be, keep reading, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. Next verse. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but they shall come up briars and thorns. Stop. Now, finish verse 6. Now, wait a minute. What does the last part of verse 6 say? I will do what? Command whom? The clouds. Now, when God commands the cloud, don't drop your rain, what does the cloud do? It does not drop the rain. God can command clouds. And what is their response? They obey. God can command the wind. What is his response? He can command the sea. What's his response? Can God command light? Yes. Go to 1st Chronicles 29, uh, 2nd Chronicles chapter 7, let's read from verse 12. 2nd Chronicles 7, verse 12. We're looking at command. We introduce to command in Genesis 1 over and over again, let there be, let there be. 2nd Chronicles 7, let's read from verse 12. 
Do you have that? All right. Read with me. What does it say? And the Lord appeared unto Sodom by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and I have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. Now carefully, verse 13. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain. Stop. How does God shut up heaven that there be no rain? He commands the cloud. Okay, fine. Keep reading. And if I command the locusts to devour the land, stop. Now we have a living thing. <laughs> Can God command the locusts? Now if you live in Africa, North Africa particularly, well, Africa, or Middle East, you know what locusts can do to your crops? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah. Do you know that a plague of locusts can come across a land, devour this farm, skip that farm, and devour that farm? And there are stories of that happening. Let me say it again. Here comes a plague of locusts, devours this farm, skips over this farm, and devours that farm. <laughs> What's that? Hmm? Okay, okay. <laughs> well, I wanted to say it, but you took my glory from me. Okay. Yes, yes. God commands the locusts, leave the farm run by the Sabbath-keeping, tithe-paying people, and go devour the farm of the guy who goes to church. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Leave it. And the locusts obey. They escape over, and they leave his farm. They devour that farm. If I command the locusts to devour the land, we have learned, and there's so much, <laughs> we won't finish at all. Genesis 1 is command, command, command. Listen to me carefully. The entire universe is the result, finish my words, of command. Then how do you get along in a universe that came into existence by command? Before you answer that, let's go to 2 Peter 3. Where is 2 Peter 3? Now we'll read very microscopically and let's think as we study God's word. 2 Peter chapter 3, let's read from verse 5. Do you have 2 Peter 3, verse 5? All right, some of you do, some of you don't. We'll wait. 2 Peter 3, verse 5, towards the back of the Bible. All right, you have that now? You have the King James, read it with me. For this they willingly are ignorant of. Come on, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. Stop. What does that mean? By the word of God, the heavens were of old? What does that mean? The heavens were created, come on, by the word of God. And the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Verse 6, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. That's the flood. Now listen to verse 7 carefully, microscopically. Read for me. Mm-hmm. What do you understand by kept in store? Uh-huh. How? How? By the same word. What do you understand by the same word? This, what's the same word? Verse, the same word that created in verse 5. Now this brings us to an important principle. Follow me closely. Let me, uh, let's take this off for now. Now, while I'm erasing the board, you can read verse 5 to 7 again. And concentrate. Please concentrate. That's why God gave us a mind. I'm going to show you something. All right, we have verse 5, 2 Peter 3, 5, we have the word. By the word of God, the heavens were of old. We have 2 Peter 3, 7, we have the same word. Now, listen to me carefully. God bless you for having good brains. What did that word do? What does this word do? preserves. But what do we understand about these two words? They're the same. So this word does two things. <laughs> what is that? It creates 
and sustains. Do you understand what that's teaching us? Let me ask you this. When God created, what was the quality of his creation? Good. Matchless. It was good. How did he do it? By his word. Then if it's the same word that creates, in what quality does God hope to maintain creation? The same quality with which it's made. I'm talking to myself again. Are you following me? The same quality by which creation was made is the same level of excellence at which God wants to preserve creation. The word. Now, what we've discovered, based on 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, let's take away a word. What, word, what can we put here now? I like you, I like you, I like you. Command. So we know now that the world was made by what? Command. What am I about to tell you? Come on, it's preserved by command. Because this word is the same as that. So this command, same thing. Creation is preserved by command. Do you see why disobedience is suicide? But we are born with a mind that hates that. So we're born suicidal. We're born loving death. <laughs> you didn't hear what I said. You're tired because it's what, three, ten minutes after three. Eight after three, same thing. We are born loving death. Because we're born hating God. And the Bible says, all they that hate me love death. Proverbs 8.36. And you will not come to me that you may have life. John 5, 40. To hate God. Now, we don't see this death because the devil told Eve, in the day you eat thereof, in other words, in the day you disobey, <laughs> your eyes shall be open. You won't die. Your eyes shall be open. You shall be as God's. The devil paints death as a blessing. So we love death, not realizing that's what we love. So Christ died not to change this, but to change that. But modern preachers will tell you, oh, when Christ died, he changed that. <laughs> and he left this. <laughs> That's what modern Christians say. He got rid of this, and he left that. <laughs> he got rid of order, and he left disorder. He got rid of life, and he left death. He died to save us from sin. We have to accept it. So God changes this. He does not change his command. He changes the mind, so our attitude to the command changes. When you realize God changes that, you'll keep the Sabbath. Let me pause. I've spoken a lot about command in Genesis. Tell me something. Don't take me off in some other direction. Command in Genesis. What have you learned? What question do you have? What contribution do you have? Let me pause and rest my vocal cords now as I listen to you. You must have some comment to make which will bless us because God speaks to you. He really does. Make a comment. Ask a question. Or say something nice about God. He always willing to hear that. I'm listening. It does not have to be a living thing to obey God. Remember when Christ was going into Jerusalem? The disciples were shouting, Hosanna. What did the Pharisees tell Christ? Tell them, keep quiet. What did Jesus say? If they hold their peace, come on the very stones will cry out. And Christ was not joking. Anything that God commands, obeys, 
except human beings made in his image. The ravens obey. Didn't God command ravens to feed Elijah? That's what the Bible says. I've commanded the ravens to feed thee there, 1 Kings 17, 4. He come, and the ravens had to know who Elijah was, where he was, what to bring him, and when. Am I talking to myself again? The ravens in obeying God had to know who Elijah was, where he was, when to bring the food, and what. <laughs> obedience, comprehensive obedience. All right, what have you learned? Let me ask you, what have you learned? Maybe that's easier for you. Yes. Yes. Is it connected to command? All right, all right. The paralytic, John 5, yes. Pool of Bethesda. Yes. No. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. 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 Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, uh, now, he listened. In that time, he did more than listen. No, no, no. He did more than listen. What else did he do? He obeyed. He obeyed. It, yes, he obeyed the word. Now, he didn't know about, the, he didn't know a lot of things. That's the goodness of God. You don't have to know a lot of things. If God tells you this and you obey it, are you with me? If God tells you this and you obey it, results come. My, my, my dilemma is, mm -hmm. if you cannot obey, which I have a heart change, mm -hmm. then which one comes first? Mm -hmm. You can't you obey know. without a heart change. We can't obey God fully. We can't obey his full law. But we can respond to... Uh, you see, when, when the Holy Spirit tells you, go to church, and you yield to that impression, that's a form of obedience. You, you see, if God had to wait until your heart is fully changed, no one could be saved. Everyone comes into the world with a little degree of faith. Are you following me? We're not saying that man was, you know, he was ready for translation. Christ said, will thou be made whole? The man said, yes. Jesus said, look, get up, take up your bed, walk. He exercised faith in whom? In Jesus. He exercised faith in Christ. Because of that, he walked. So all I can say is he exercised faith in Christ. Now, you may say he was not justified, but I don't know if that's correct. Go to verse 14 of John 5. Let's see. You go to uh, verse 14 of John 5. Let's see if we can answer your question. Because a lot of things are not written, but we can reason and come to the right conclusion. John 5, verse 14. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Now, did Jesus say sin no more to somebody else? Who? The woman. Now, go to John 8. Just three chapters to the right. John 8. Let's read verse 11 of John 8. Read for me, my good pastor. Uh -huh. Now, if Jesus doesn't condemn you, what does he do? He justifies you. Then what did he tell her? Now, why would he say sin no more? Because I've delivered you. Are you following me? I've delivered you. Now, don't keep, now, while we don't see the words, I've forgiven you, he tells the man the same thing. So we can assume that man left in what condition? Not only physically restored, but spiritually. Jesus says the same thing. Now, it may not be written, but we have to reason ourselves to that conclusion. But let me also say, everyone comes into the world with a small measure of faith in order to be able to respond to the Spirit. Christ doesn't wait until you're sinless to come to Him. He starts moving in your life before you're changed. 
That's why this was the light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Without that initial down payment of faith and the spirit, even in a sinner, that sinner can't respond to God. So everyone comes into the world with a gift from God, a degree of faith. So when the Spirit comes, the person with that faith can respond. Then that faith begins to grow. All right, Pastor. Somebody else. Somebody else. Yes, Bill. I think my question is a little bit serious. I want to ask that when we born, we born with sin, does it mean that when we are born, we have the tendency to become a sinner? No, we don't have the tendency to become a sinner. We're born contrary to God. We're born with tendencies to sin, and that's the only tendency we have. That's where we're born. You know, it's a, you see this, this bottle? Uh, let me put it on the board here for you. That's a very important question, by the way. Very important question. And we'll go to Genesis now to provide some answers. Here is great, there's God. Here is Satan. And here's a long line, Okay. You with me? All right. There's the upright line. That's you, that's me. When we're born, we're born leaning in this direction. That's how we're born. When we're converted, we do what? We move in this direction. No one is born leaning this way. No one. Well, of course, Christ has to be exempted. No one is born leaning in this direction. We are born leaning in this direction. Now, even though we're born leaning in that direction, did I cause an earthquake? Okay. Even though we're born this way, let me take this one off so we're not having any schizophrenia here. All right. Yet, we come with... A little measure of faith, which is entirely a gift from God. This little faith allows us now, it is like a receptor site on a cell. Uh, is this too scientific? Okay, let's forget the receptor sites. Well, let's keep the receptor sites, okay. <laughs> which is where the call of the Spirit combined and caused the person now to respond to God. Every person who comes into the world comes leaning that way, but with a gift from God. Now, you'll take me in another direction. <laughs> Christ's birth is the great mystery of the Bible. We don't have all the precise, all we can say about Christ's birth and Christ's life is that his battle with sin is an example for us. That's what we can say. We can conquer sin just the way he did, and that's the central, the most important thing. We can conquer sin just like Jesus. But Jesus was God and man, so there are mysteries we cannot, we cannot really understand. But we can conquer like he does, and Revelation 3.21 tells us that. So, Brother Bill, that's how we come into the world. And God in his goodness, that's why Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Based on that, we can have this gift. Yes, sister. Now, that's what I'm trying to tell my sister. There are mysteries about Christ we, we don't understand. All I can say is, uh-huh. Oh, he took our nature. He took our nature, yes. He took our nature, yes, yes, yes. yes. He took our nature, yes. Mm, yeah. Hebrews 2.14, yes. 2.10 to 4. He took our nature, yes. That's why we can conquer the way he conquered. Oh, yes, yes. Christ didn't come like he came in our condition. Okay. That's the way we're born. So God does something to, brave, to take us in this direction. That's what conversion does in this direction. And sanctification keeps us in that direction. But not only in this direction, because you can be this direction this way and this way. With sanctification, we become going more like this. <laughs> Where are we going to? More like? More like? More like what? More like God. Yes, more like God. Mm -hmm. Sanctification. You see, this is the upright line. All right? That's the dividing line. Anything on this side is leaning towards God. But this person is leaning towards God, but not the mess as much as this person. So this is a thief on the cross. This is Enoch. Are you with me? 
So sanctification has us leaning more and more and more as we see the goodness of God until we are just lost in God. And God in us, we in God, God in Christ, Christ in us, John 14, verse 19 to 20. 20. Okay, someone else now asks an easy question. Somebody. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it possible because God gave us reasoning and choice? Well, of course, He gave us choice, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. It's a tremendous risk. Yes, true, true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they still obey. Yes. They don't reason. No. No. And God made us that way so we can choose to serve him. And he wants us to choose intelligently. Let me show you something else. Thank you for that. Watch, watch this. Watch this. Now, what did God tell Adam would happen if he consumed the fruit? Thou shalt surely what? die. No doubt. No, no, sorry. I have to, I shall, surely it's right over here. Now, what did the devil tell Eve? Listen carefully. Let me ask you this. Now, how much of the Word of God do we find in Genesis 1? Do we find God talking a lot in Genesis 1? Yes, give me some examples of what he said. Let it be light. Let it be, yeah, okay, all the way, God talking, talking, talking. We have examples of God's word and the results of God's word. Now, Adam opens his eyes and he sees the creation, he sees his creator. We have to believe God spoke to him, told him how all this happened. So Adam knows and Eve knows that the birds were made by the word of God, the trees, the water, the sun, moon, and stars, everything, they know that. God spoke it, they know that. Because God wants us to know about him. Now, when the devil tempted Eve, the devil tried to get Eve to doubt what? The word of God. Follow me closely. He wanted Eve to follow what? If the devil wants you to doubt God's word, what does he want you to believe? His word. Okay, I missed you. My fault. Let me try again. If the devil wants you to doubt God's word, what does he want you to believe? His word. Where was the serpent being used by the devil? Most likely in the tree. Where was Eve standing? Where was she standing? But what was she standing on? Most likely grass. Did she know grass was made by the word of God? Yes, she had to know. Did she know the serpent was made by the word of God? Yes, the creeping things on day six. What was over her head? The sky. Did she know the firmament was made by God? Yes. What was shining on her nice hair? The sun. What flew past? <laughs> did she know God? God told her. Or oh, Adam did. Which means that Eve knew that everything she could see was made how? Of whom? Ah, of God. Hmm? What did she have as evidence that the word of the devil had any power? Nothing. Are you following me? What was in the garden the devil produced? Nothing. I'm coming to that. <laughs> That's the mystery, Brother Bill. That's the mystery. There was no proof at all that the devil's word had any power. Surrounded by proof of the power of God's word, she still chose what? The devil's word. You explain that to me. The mystery, how can she, how? But there's not a mystery today. He has gone on for 2,000 years. There isn't a verse in the Bible that supports Sunday as a Sabbath. <laughs> not one. Are you with me? And yet, the whole world chooses someone else's word and observes Sunday. <laughs> Sunday. 
So Brother Bill wants to know, how can that happen? It's how can... Yes, Pastor. Well, yes, yeah. It's 3.30 just about. Um, now, I will go with my people because if I'm supposed to have breaks and I can take the break at the end and we end sooner, that's, that's one way. Well, yes, while we're on the roll, all of us are on the roll with God. If we stop, the devil may take over, so let's keep going. <laughs> Is that okay? All right, okay. Now, let's look at something else in the book of Genesis. What did I say is the problem with the world? Sin. Now, sin is a tricky thing. Let's look at sin and see how merciful God is. Go to 1 John chapter 3. Let's read verse 4. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. You have that? Yes. And let me, let me just say to you how blessed I am that you love the Word of God. And God bless you for that. I really mean it, seriously. We live in a world where people couldn't care less about God or His Word. And they trust themselves and their degrees and what the leaders tell them. But you seem to love God's Word. May the Lord bless your life and lead you. And may your love for God's Word only increase and increase until you are lost in God. And he comes to take you home. All right, 1 John 3, read verse 4 for me. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. Come on. For sin is the transgression of the law. That is a definition of sin. The only Bible definition of sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. The law being the Ten Commandments of God. Now you may say, why do you say the Ten Commandments? Go to James chapter 2. James 2. Let's read from verse 8 of James 2. If he fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. Keep reading. But if ye have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as a transgressor. Keep reading. For he that said what? Do not commit adultery, said also do not kill. In other words, James is quoting from what? The Ten Commandments. He doesn't have to quote all ten. If I were to say to you, please identify the country based on these cities. And I say, Beijing, Shanghai, what do you say? China. Do I need to list all the cities in China? No. If I were to say, identify the country, New York, Los Angeles, what do you say? The United States. If I were to say, identify the country, Kuala Lumpur, uh, Penang, or Malang, what do you say? Malaysia. Let me give you a hard one. Melbourne, Adelaide, <laughs> Australia. Okay, Victoria. <laughs> but that's a province. Okay, all right. Now, so we deal with the Ten Commandments. The Bible says, sin is a transgression of the law. But we need to look deeper into sin and see the mercy of God. Go to first, not first John, go to John 15. John 15. Let's read verse 22. Read for me. If I had not what? Come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. Stop. Let's pray. God, be with us again, I pray, as we enter another phase where I've misspoken, forgive me. Give me more of your spirit. Hide me behind the cross and give understanding to your lovely people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Read that verse again microscopically. If I had not come, uh-huh, 
What did he mean by if I had not come and spoken unto them? Listen again. If I had not come and spoken unto them, what does that mean? What's that? No, listen again. Okay, let's, uh, let's say someone drives at 60 miles, or what do you, kilometers in, uh, down the street. But there's no sign that says the speed is 30 kilometers per hour. You see? But let's say there is a sign that says 30 and you do 60. You go to the judge. The judge said, look, did you see the sign? Yes. Then you're what? You're guilty. Now, if there were no signs, you drove at 60. And the judge says, were there signs? And you said, what? No. The judge said, okay, you didn't know. We're going to put the signs up. Now, if you do 60 again, there's a cell waiting for you. Are you following me? Good. Now, Jesus says, if I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. What is sin? All right. So Christ is saying, if I hadn't told them what is, the, or what is, what does the law tell us? What does the law tell us? How to live. What's right and wrong? What's acceptable to God, what isn't? Of course, what is sin, yes. Now, Christ is saying, if I hadn't given them instructions as to how to live their lives, I could not charge them with sin. He doesn't say they did not sin. He said, by saying they had not had sin, there's no sin charged to them. Now, you need to be very careful. You need to follow me. When Christ says, if I had not come and spoken, when Christ speaks, what is he giving? When anyone speaks, what is the person giving? Ah, yes. Yes, information systems. Yes, he's giving. Yes, information. Now, and the information is 60 miles per or kilometer per hour. That's the information. Now, based on this information, you can make a decision as how to relate to that. Hmm? This is information. Now, you decide what your behavior will be. Christ said, I came to give, to give information. Now, if I didn't give information, they're not charged. But not being charged doesn't mean you didn't sin. You're just not held guilty. We have to understand that to understand sin. An ignorant sin is still a sin. But, but what? You're not charged. Let me pause. Let you dwell on that. An ignorant sin is a sin, but God doesn't hold you guilty. Why? Because you don't know. That's mercy. That's mercy. But since it's still a sin, it has to go somewhere. Somebody has to pay. Are you listening? Somebody has to pay. Now, who's that? Jesus. All sins of ignorance are placed on Christ, along with all forgiven sins. Now, let's go back to the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3. No, let's read 2, 16, 17 first. You can never read that too often. We just said all sins of ignorance are placed on Christ because they're still sins. So, in order for someone to be charged with a sin by God, what does the person have to have? In order for God to hold you guilty, what do you have to have? Information. Yes. And God says, you knew and you disobeyed, you're guilty. Now, Genesis 2, 16, 17, read for me. Come on, read. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. What has God given Adam? information as to how to live. You can do that. Don't do that. Now God says, in the day you eat, or in the day you do what? Yes, but in the day you do what? Now don't give me eat. Well, yeah, in the day you sin. But you sin by doing what? 
disobey what? The command. That's the word in verse 16. The Lord God commanded in the day you sin or in the day you eat or in the day you disobey the information you have, you'll die. Now, listen to God in verse 17. Not verse 17. Verse, let's read 9 to 11 of Genesis 3. You're looking at sin. Genesis 3, 9 to 11. Read for me. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him what? Uh-huh. Keep reading. I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now listen to God in verse 11. Read for me carefully. And he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Come on, carefully. Hast thou eaten, uh-huh, of the tree? Whereof? Uh-huh. Now, God said, I commanded you. What is he saying? I gave you information. Now, God is saying, did you go against what? The information that I gave you. That is sin. Listen to verse 17 of chapter 3. Listen again. The same concept. And unto Adam he said, what? Because of hearken not the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not. God is saying, because you did what you knew you shouldn't do. Then, sin that carries what? Penalty. Sin that carries penalty for the sinner, or sin that carries guilt. Let's use guilt is the willful violation of what? Oh, give me another word we've been using. The information given to us by God. Listen to me again. Sin that carries guilt is the willful violation of the revealed will of God. Adam knew that's what God said. Did you do what I told you not to do? No one is punished for genuinely ignorant sin. That's mercy. Even though an ignorant sin still violates the law of God, Christ takes that. And then the Holy Ghost tries to open your eyes to see, yes, you're sinning ignorantly, but here's what you should know. When you find out, you still confess. Let me say it again. Sin that carries guilt and penalty for the sinner is the willful violation of the revealed will of God. Ignorant sin does not carry guilt. So we introduce the sin. God said you knew and you violated. That's why Jesus says, if I had not come and spoken to them, they had not had sin. They had not had sin charged to them. Go to Acts 17. Read verse 30. Acts 17, verse 30. Do you have that? Read for me. What does that verse say? And the times of this ignorance, God... Yeah, one verse says overlook. What does the King James say? He winked at. God is so good. And even though God hates sin, if you don't know, God overlooks it. Somebody say amen for God. <laughs> if you don't know. But you see, God does not value ignorance. Listen to me carefully. Even though your sin may be ignorant and God doesn't punish you, you still suffer. Because sin always destroys. What do I mean by that? If you don't know smoking will destroy your lungs and you smoke innocently. There was a time when doctors recommended smoking. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? There was a, maybe the 1800s or the early, they recommended smoking. They did it innocently. Did the patients improve? Mm -hmm. So an ignorant sin still damages you. And God is not a God of ignorance. So God always brings us opportunity to get more light. So we may see, wait a minute, even though God doesn't charge me, I'm still hurting myself. Sin always damages. 
always, ignorant or not, sin always damages. And so from the Garden of Eden we learn that the sin that carries guilt, which is the one central to salvation, is the willful violation of information we have. All right. The violation of God's law. That is sin. Go to John 9. Let's read verse 41 of John 9. My favorite book is Genesis, but my next one is John. It's a beautiful book. All right, someone nice and loud, read for me verse 41 of John 9. Jesus said unto them what? If you were blind. Now what does it mean by you were blind? If you don't, uh, Bill, I like you. If you did not know. Because ignorance is blindness. So if, come on, read verse now for me. If you're blind, uh-huh. You have no sin. I wouldn't charge you. But now you say, therefore your sin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The sin I didn't charge you with when you were ignorant, I charge you with now that you know. Now, let me ask you this. Don't answer me. What are you doing that's wrong? You're not blind. You know you're wrong. <laughs> but you keep doing it. Don't answer me. What is it you're doing? You're not blind. You know it's wrong. And keep doing it. Stop. Don't go home and think about it. Stop right where you're sitting. Make a decision. Let me stop this willful violation of God's law. Why should you stop it? Let me, <laughs> let me tell you why you should stop it as soon as you can. And I should stop as soon as I can. Go to Genesis 1-1 again. And I'm going to end on this note. I have a lot more to tell you about Genesis, but... Go to Genesis 1 1. Why should you stop? Genesis 1 1. Read for me without looking. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. All right. Now, what was creation? Go to verse 1 and 2 of chapter 2. Verse 1 and 2 of chapter 2. Read for me. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. Come on. And on the seventh day, God ended his work. Stop. Now look at that verse 2 of chapter 2. Look at verse 1 of chapter 1. Tell me the relationship between creation and work. What happened in verse 1? What did God do? He created. What did he do in verse 2 of chapter 2? Rested from what? What is, what is creation? Work. Creation is work. The very first person in the Bible to work is God. The very first person to rest is God. Creation is work. What did God do from his work? He rested. What does that mean? Read verse 2 again. Read the whole verse and see what it means to rest. He ended his work which he had made. Keep reading. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Stop. He, end he stopped. Did he resume creation in chapter 2 or 3? No, he stopped. He was done. Are you listening to me? Ah, God, give me the right words. Listen to me. God worked on the first day. What did he make? He worked on the second day. What did he make? He worked on the third day. What did he make? Vegetation and separate water from dry land. He worked on day four. What did he make? Sun, moon, and stars. He worked on day five. What did he make? the birds and the fish. He worked on day six. What did he make? Land animals and mankind. Then what happened? He stopped. Did he go back to working? Creating? No. He's done. Listen to me carefully. And we celebrate what day? Sabbath to commemorate the work of God. We rest. God worked and he's done. When Christ was on the cross, what did he say when he, just before he died? It's finished. It's finished. All, the, all that was necessary for salvation, finished. It's in place. Not that he had nothing else to do, but it's in place, and he didn't have to die again or do anything else. He died, he rose, he's interceding, it's finished. 
the death finished, the sacrifice paid. Now to apl apply the merits, but the sacrifice, okay, it's finished. Salvation is spiritual creation. All right, I lost you again. It's my fault, it's my fault. What did I just say? Salvation. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Okay. Go to 2 Corinthians 5, read verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Ah, uh, read for a beautiful verse. Let's read together. What does it say? If any man be in Christ, he's in you. Now, someone who has a different version from the King James, read for me. Yes. Salvation is a work of creation. What did David pray in Psalm 51.10? Don't go there. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew. It's a work of creation. Now, what did God use when he created? Word. Word. What raw materials did he use? Nothing. Nothing. The scholars say creation is ex nihilo, which means what? Out of nothing. You know that's the way you're saved? Out of nothing? Same way. Go to John 7, read verse 18. <clears throat> John 7, verse 18. When you found it, say amen. Read for me. What is Paul saying? Read nice and clear. What did I say, John? Oh, no, Romans. My mistake, please. I need to eat my muffin. That's the problem. Okay, John. No, I said John again. Romans 7, verse 18. I am sorry for misleading you. It's a terrible thing when a preacher misleads people. All right. Romans 7, verse 18. For I know this, that in me, Come on, that is in my flesh. Stop. What's the flesh? What's the flesh? The carnal nature. The fallen condition that leans away from God. Now, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, go on now, dwelleth. Wait a minute. What does Paul say is in the flesh? Nothing good in the flesh. I mean, absolutely nothing. Let's get some support for that. Go to John 6. Now we go to John. Listen to Jesus agreeing with Paul. John 6. You found John 6? Verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. Come on, the flesh profiteth what? Nothing. Stop. Jesus says the flesh has no benefits. It profiteth nothing. That's Christ. But let's get more evidence. John chapter 3. Let's read verse 6. John chapter 3, verse 6. Thank you, Brother Bill. Read for me. What does it say? That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, what is Jesus doing in that verse? What is he saying? All right. Let me give you a schematic. That which is born of the flesh is all flesh. That which is born of the spirit is all spirit. What is he saying about the flesh and the spirit? Yeah, they're different. What else? Now, that which is born of the flesh, he gives two things. I want you to really think. Think hard. That is true. That is absolutely true. Listen again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now let me help you. What do you not find in the flesh? The Spirit. What do you not find in the Spirit? The flesh. Now, if you're flesh, you're just flesh. In other words, what are the good things in the carnal nature? None. So that here I come to God. Save me. Do I have any raw materials I can give God? No. 
God has to create what? A brand new being. Spiritually. And that's literally true. So he told Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be improved. Is that what he told Nicodemus? You must be born again. You've got to start all over. Then he said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. So Nicodemus, you are flesh. To become spirit, you've got to start life all over again. You have to be recreated in the image of God. This is done by the word of God. Go to 1 Peter 1. I'm telling you, physical creation and spiritual creation are done the same way. Physical creation is a symbol of spiritual creation. That's why Christ told so many parables. He used the physical to teach the spiritual. Now, 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's read verse 23. Let me speak slowly, please. When I go quickly because I'm excited, tell me stop. Please, don't just sit there looking nice. Tell me stop. What book did I say? What chapter? What verse? Nice and clear, somebody read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the word of God, which liveth in the... Now, what does being born again mean? What does it mean? Give me another word for born again. Recreated, give me another word that Christians use. Reborn, yes, the new birth. Give me another word, starts with C. Conversion. <laughs> but you convert it from what to what? From this, mm, it's an absolute change because this is pure flesh, this is pure spirit. And how is that done? By the word. How is physical creation done? By the word. But let's get another support for the word. Go to James 1, read verse 18. This is the half brother of Jesus. James 1, read verse 18. Do you have that? What does it say? Of his own will, come on, begat he us with the word of truth. What does begat mean? To give birth to. How does God give us birth spiritually? By his word. Listen to me. Conversion takes place by the reception of the life-giving word of God into the heart. You believe it? The power of the word does its work. The same way we're created physically. We're created spiritually. Out of nothing. By the word of God. Any questions? Physical creation. Now. I love God, let me tell you, I love God, I really do. He's a nice person, always nice to me. Now, when God created physically, did he stop? Come on. Did he stop? And he rested. Did he go back and start creating again? No. When God creates spiritually, will he come to the place where he stops? Come on, answer me. Yes. God will not always beg you to obey him. There will come a time when God will stop and his rest will last, will last forever. No more second chance. There's coming a day when God will rest from spiritual creation. So every Sabbath, please remember, as God rested from physical creation, one day he will cease spiritual creation and there will be no more opportunity for anyone to be saved. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So don't think, well, well uh, I'll come to God when I'm 50. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Because you, when you're 50, you, perhaps God will have already stopped. He stopped physical creation, he'll stop spiritual creation. And that's it. If you need to be right with God, do it now. 
Did God try to save the people in the days of Noah? Yes. How long did he ask Noah to preach? Did Noah preach the words of God, yes or no? Then that was God preaching. When you say God's word, that's God. Ah, you missed it. When you speak God's word, that's God. That's why the Bible says Christ went by the Spirit and spoke to the, the, the spirits in prison, meaning those in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing. And the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. So 120 years God begged and pleaded. He's trying to create spiritually. And then after 120 years, God was done. That's it. The ark was shut. He stopped his spiritual creation. And he did not open that door until all people were dead. If you need to be right with God, do it now. By a simple Lord, I recommit my life to you. Forgive me. Thank you for being patient up to this point, but let me not abuse your long suffering. Don't do that. Because God's spiritual creation will cease. And that Sabbath of rest from spiritual creation will last forever. Sin is the willful violation of the known will of God. So the question is, do you know something to be right and you're not doing it or I? Stop that. But some people may say, well, if ignorance gives me an excuse, let me stay in ignorance. No. Mm -mm. I have gone to places to preach and people said, don't tell me. <laughs> no, no, don't tell me. There is no safety in don't tell me. You know, L.O.I. tells us there are two reasons, two, two things that must be present for God to accept it as ignorance. One. I didn't know. Two, I had no way of knowing. You must have those two things. I didn't know. I had no way of knowing. God accepts that. But if you didn't know, but you could have found out. Whoops. <laughs> and that whoops will echo through the universe. You're in trouble. You could have found out. Four o'clock. What subjects have we covered from Genesis? God is big. Huh? The word of God, the power to create. What else we found out from Genesis so far? God, oh, he's merciful. Yes, he really is. Come on, somebody else. What is sin? And what is sin? Transgression of the known will of God. But let's be more precise. What is sin that carries guilt? The transgression of the known will of God. Not all sin carries guilt, but all sin damages. And the sin that does not carry guilt is the sin where we genuinely did not know. Genuinely didn't know, had no way of knowing. What else did we learn about God in Genesis? Or what did we learn from Genesis? Come on, you're all bright people. You just... God's word is his command. Keep the word command in mind. What did we learn from Genesis? Keep the word command in mind. What did we learn? God created by command. Now, if physical creation is spiritual creation, how does God save? You didn't hear me? Let me say it again. How was physical creation done? How is spiritual creation done? By command. But with our cooperation, you see. So God, here I am. And God commands. He creates by command. Physically and sp What else do we learn about command in Genesis? Think. In what direction is the universe moving? The direction of obedience to God's command. In what direction does a sinner move? The opposite direction. So the purpose of salvation is to do what? Turn us around so we can move in the same direction as God and the entire universe. Because sin places us out of order. Ellen White writes the book Education, page 1999, paragraph 2, I think it is. To transgress his law, physical, mental, or moral is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe to introduce discord, anarchy, ruin. I think it's educated. Someone can check it, 99, paragraph 2. To transgress his law, 
physical, mental, or moral is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe. Yes. Did God, how did God create man? Ah. Ah, what a handsome man you are. <laughs> now, the spirit, I, I was talking to God while I was talking to you, and I said, God, should I raise that point? And the spirit told me back then, no. So I guess he meant not then. What time is it? <laughs> Four. Okay. Now, for those of you who preach, never preach to be sensational. Don't preach to shock people because you run into trouble. But never hesitate to preach the truth. Are you with me? All right. Let's pray. Father, direct me, please, as I try to respond to that very, very serious question my brother just asked. You tell me what to say, what not to say. I really mean it, Father. If you tell me don't say it, I won't. If you tell me to say it, I will. But if you tell me say it, tell me how to say it. In the few remaining moments, I pray from my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Go back to Genesis 1. While you're looking for Genesis 1, who has prayed for me and said, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth? Uh, to uh, God bless you. God bless you. The rest of you who are good looking but stubborn, please pray for me. <laughs> please pray for me and ask God to put his words in my mouth. I need it. I really do. Okay. Genesis 1. Read verse 3. The first few words. Mm -hmm. Let there be light. Now. We learn from 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. What was that? Look at that. Read verse 6. Let it be affirmed. Now, what's that? There has to be a command. Read verse uh, 9. Let the waters under the heavens. What is that? A command. Verse 11. Let the earth bring forth grass. What is that? Mm -hmm. Verse 14. Uh-huh. Let, <laughs> let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. Read verse 20. Mm-hmm. Come on, read with energy. Come on. Yeah, bring forth abundantly the moving creature. Now, nah, read verse 24. All right, stop. Each of these is what? Come on. Pause. Somebody needs to pray for me. <laughs> read verse 26. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Read verse 26. Does it begin the same way? Yes. Listen to me carefully. How did God make animals? Just tell me. Don't read. Tell me. By command. Are animals living beings? Yes. Let me show you how similar animals are to people. Read Genesis 2, 7. Genesis 2, 7. The Lord God formed man of the... Stop. Let's stop right there. What do we have in that verse? God formed man dust. We have who, what, how. Or from what material. Read verse 19. Mm -hmm. Do we have ground in seven? Do we have ground in seven? Keep reading. Now, do we have the Lord in verse seven? Do we have him in verse 19? Keep reading. Now, do we have formed in verse seven? Do we have formed in verse 19? All right, go on. So we have a living thing in 19. Do we have a living thing in seven? Yes. What am I showing you? They made the same way. Now, it's hard to get tradition out of the head. When you grow up thinking a certain way, even though there's no biblical basis for it, it's hard to see things differently. Go to Ecclesiastes 3. <laughs> ah, my brother, I'm glad. I'm also sorry you raised that question. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm glad and sorry at the same time, but... Uh, 
No, and the, I really asked the Spirit, should I say that earlier? The Spirit said no. When he asked it, I said, the Spirit said, now's the time to answer. Sorry. Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. We read verse 19. Thanks, Brother Bill. Do you have that? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Now you're really eager to read. Okay. Do you have Ecclesiastes 3.19? Read for me, those of you who have my version. For that which befalleth the sons of befalleth. Stop. Someone read another version, just those words for me. Uh-huh. Okay. Man's fate is like that of the animals. Give me another version. The New King James. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, what happens to people? Happens. So we are seeing there's a sameness between men and animals, of course, at the physical level. Why do I say the physical level? Let's keep reading. We start again, verse 19. For that which befalleth the sons of men, come on, befalleth beasts. So we have people and animals. Keep reading. Even one thing befalleth them. We'll find that one thing is death, of course. Now, keep reading. As the one dieth, they die the same way. Stop. They die the same way. The removal of what? The breath of life. Keep reading. Yea, they have all. Pause. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? What, what did you just read? They have the same breath. <laughs> this is physical. Keep reading. So that a man have no preeminence above a beast. This is physically. When you bury an animal, after a few months, what do you come and find? When you bury a man, after a few months, what do you come and find? Same thing. The Bible says, when it comes to dying and living, animals die the same way people die. They have the same breath. Go to the chapter on the flood, Genesis 7. Let me write a few things when you read. Genesis 7. You know, this is the most interested you have looked since I started speaking at 1. Since he raised that question. I mean, you're reading with such eagerness now. <laughs> Your curiosity has been aroused. All right. Genesis 7. This is the story of the flood. Let's read from 20, then we go to 21 and 22. All right. 20. No, 20. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. Stop. The Bible tells us the highest mountains were covered. Fifteen cubits, the waters rose above the highest mountains. Are you following me, Brother Bill? The waters of the flood rose 15 cubits above the high. A cubit is about 18 inches. Fifteen times that, you know what that is. All right. Now, the Bible will now identify and itemize what was drowned. Read verse 21. Stop, 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 stop. All flesh died. Come on. That moved upon the earth. Keep reading. Stop. Fowls. Uh-huh. Come on. Cattle. Beasts. Well, hold on, hold on. Let me write. Go on. Creeping. Things. And... Man. Now, look at that list again. What do we have? Now, this list refers to everything that died. That was on the face of the earth. Fowls, cattle, beasts, creeping things, man. Now, read verse 22. Whose nostrils... Ah, stop. The Bible says all of these had what? the same breath. Is this my opinion or are you reading the Bible? It lists what all flesh is. This. And all flesh have the same breath. What is the fundamental unit of energy in a living system? Adenosine triphosphate. Is that it? 
ATP. Fundamental unit of energy in this and in that. Now go back to Ecclesiastes 3. We read 19, we move right the way down to 21. We're trying to answer the question, was man made by command? Okay. Genesis 3, let's read from verse 19. It is uh, 11 after 4. I'll stop at 4.30. Ecclesiastes, sorry my brother, God bless you. Ecclesiastes 3, 19 to 21. I want you to read for me clearly as the Holy Ghost moves in your heart. Read. All right, are we ready? Read with me. What does it say? For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other. Keep reading. Yea, they have all one breath. Come on. So that a man hath no preeminence above a beast. They die the same way. Keep reading 20. Read 20 now. All. Stop, stop, stop. All go where? Where's that? Yeah. So if you say a man when he dies goes to heaven, you have to say what? A cow when it dies what? Uh, I'm talking to myself again. Nobody's listening. Read verse 20 again. All go. Yes, where is that? Well, the verse tells you. Keep reading. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> they go the same place at death to dust. Now, Go to Psalm 33. Let's read verse 6 and verse 9. Thirty-three of Psalms. Let's read verse 6 and verse 9. Stop. What do you understand by the heavens? Yeah, what do you mean by the heavens? Does that include the stars? The moon? The planet? Yes. Everything in the heavens. Keep reading. And all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Keep reading. For he? Verse 9. For he spake, verse 9. Uh huh. Uh huh. Now, this, is that, did God also make the earth? Did he also make the earth? Everything in it? How? All right. Now, the question is did God make man by command? As he did, it, the answer is yes. The Bible never tells us God scooped up dirt with his hand, it doesn't tell us that. God's instrument of operation is his word. Let's reason together. <laughs> Go to John 11. You really ought to be praying for me at this time. Lord, tell that man what to say so he doesn't confuse us. Please pray. Please pray. This is serious business. Do you have John 11? That's a chapter where God la Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Let's read verse from verse 39. Uh-huh. Take him with the stone. Martha said unto him, what? Come on, what did Martha say? Lord, by this time, stop, stop. Now listen to me carefully. What did she mean by, Lord, by this time, he stinketh? What did she mean? He was decomposing. What is decomposition? Mm -hmm. Go, going back to what? Are you with me? No, are you with the Bible? What did Martha say by this time? Why did Jesus only spend three days in the grave? It was prophesied that what? He would not see destruction or corruption. 
his body would not begin to decompose. That's why he only spent three days. It was prophesied he would not see corruption before he came back. Lazarus was there how long? He had begun to see corruption. Are you following me? Decomposition had set in. Now, keep reading. Read from verse 43 now. Read 43. Had spoken, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. Come on. He that was what? Give me another word for he that was dead. Based on what Martha said. He that was? Decomposed. <laughs> Say it differently. He that was going back to? Uh-huh. What was Adam made from? Dust. Okay, okay. Pause thing. Where was Jesus standing? Outside what? What's between Jesus and Lazarus? A rock. He is outside the tomb. What's in that tomb? A man going back to dust. What did Jesus do? He spoke. And what happened to that dust? A man. Let's get more Bible proof. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. Let's read from verse 16 or just 16. First Thessalonians, written by the Apostle Paul, verse 4, not verse 4, chapter 4, sorry. We'll read verse 16. Read with me. What does it say? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven now, carefully, with a stop. Keep reading. Stop, voice. Keep reading. Trumpet. Aha. Uh -huh. Now. Keep reading. Stop. Are these three different things Christ is coming with? Are these three different things he's coming with? No. They all refer to the voice of Christ who speaks. Now, with a shout, meaning that he speaks how? How did he speak at Lazarus' tomb? With a loud voice. Lazarus came up. He comes with a shout. Come on. That's his voice. As loud as a trumpet. What's the... Fifth feast of the seven. Feast of trumpets. To do what? To inform the Israelites. The day of atonement is coming. It has to be loud. He comes with a shout, the voice, trumpet. As a result of this voice, he has to say something. What happens? Uh -huh. The dead in Christ rise. Now, let's think a little further. How far back do the dead in Christ go? Adam, all right, okay. <laughs> Follow with me. If anyone is dust, it's Adam. <laughs> Am I giving my opinion? Yeah. Yes? <laughs> Am, I <laughs> Am I giving my opinion? No. If anyone is dust, or maybe Abel, who died before Adam. Now here is pure dust. Hmm? The remains of Abel, dust, everything, even the bones now are dust. Now, where is Christ when he shouts? Because he doesn't come to the earth. Now, with Lazarus, he was right outside the tomb. With, he is somewhere in the, 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 the atmosphere. He doesn't touch the earth. So anyone on earth who says, I'm Christ, you know that's wrong. And he shouts to the dead in Christ. When he raised Lazarus, did he call him by name? Yeah. Or everyone else would have gotten up. Are you sorry me this? <laughs> now, when he raises, he just raises the righteous. He must form, he must have a name for just the righteous. Because there are many wicked dead who are dead. And when the life giver calls, everybody comes up. He calls specifically. And Abel, who 
is dust more than anyone else will come up with no use of his hands. Adam was made by the word of God. Eve was made by the word of God. God removed that rib by his word. God formed it by his word. We already found out that the word that creates, come on, sustains. Now, if you tell me Adam was not made by God's word, what sustains us? If you take away the word, what sustains us? We are sustained by the very thing by which man was made. Adam was not made by God kicking a handful of dirt. It, how does God save? By his word. We read that. How does God maintain creation? By his word. How does God create? By his word. How does God cast out demons? By his word. How did he heal the sick? By his word. How does he forgive? By his word. How did he make man? By his word. When you see the hands of God, it's a symbolic expression. When I consider thy thing, the, 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 the heavens, the works of thy thing. No, no, the Bible says he spoke. But because it's his work, his product, it is called the works of thy hands. Mankind was made by command. And mankind is to live, finish my words, by command. That's how we fit into a universe made by command. Everything in the universe is under command, including man. So while it's poetic to say God got down on his knees and he was personally involved, yes, his word. His personal involvement was not how he shaped his hand, was the fact that he made us in his image. That's the personal side. And by the way, Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 45, paragraph 2, God was to bear man's image both in outward resemblance and in character. We look like God. The animals did not. That's personal. Not that he used his hands and got dust on his fingernails. No. He spoke. How will he raise the dead at the second coming? He speaks. The breath of life, he breathed it in. It's the word of God is life. Yes, he breathed, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Did the breath of life come to Lazarus? Everything is by, God didn't come down and put his mouth to it. No, it's by the word of God. Because the word is life. When God said, Lazarus, come forth, answer me, did the breath of life come to Lazarus, yes or no? Why do you say yes so softly? <laughs> did the breath of life come to Lazarus? Yes. Did Jesus put his mouth up to that? No. There's life in the word. That's why the word of God is above everything else. Everything else. Trust this. That is why everything must be judged by the word. Everything. If the Holy Ghost convicts you, it must be judged by the word. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I've been talking a long time, so I want some easy questions. <laughs> what time is this? It's uh, 25 after 4. And I have to speak again tonight. I'm not coming back to Australia. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> now nah, I sin, that's not true. Okay, all right. What have you learned today? Let me ask you that. What have you learned? Somebody. Yes, my sister. Uh -huh. 
and we're forgiven by the word. Mm -hmm. Remember the woman who washed his feet with tears, dried them with her hair? Verse 48, I think, John, uh, Luke 7, he said, Thy sins be forgiven thee. He said it. He said it. Somebody else, what have you learned? Please tell me you learned something. I'm not, and, oh, yes, sister. Say it again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's so clear. Yes. You go to dirt. Yes. But even before, you, let, let's, okay, let's go to Genesis 3 again. <laughs> Sister, you're making me talk too much. Genesis 3, God bless you. <laughs> By the way, I know people like to talk, but when I'm done here, I don't want to talk. I want to rest this because I have to talk tonight. So please, I'm a nice man, but I don't want to talk. <laughs> I must rest the voice. <laughs> okay. Genesis 3. Sister, thanks for raising that the immortality of the soul, this rubbish that people believe in. Let's look at 17 now down to 20, uh, down to 19. Genesis 3. Let's pause. Let's pray one more time. Father, as we close on this very significant point, the immortality of the soul, which is a lie, one more time give us the spirit of truth and tell me what to say in humility. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Read verse 17 now. Listen microscopically. When you read the Bible, read as if you're listening to the voice of God talking to you. Let's read. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Come on. Curse is the ground for thy sake. Stop. What did God curse? Say it again. What did he curse? Now, people believe Adam was made from breath and ground. Listen to Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. He formed him from that. That's one action. Then breathed into his nostrils. Adam was not made from dirt and breath. He was made from dirt. Listen to God. Curse is the ground for thy sake. He didn't say curse is the ground and the breath. Curse is the ground. That's where you came from. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Next verse. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Keep reading. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Now slowly till thou... Where? Now wait a minute. In order to return someplace, what has to happen before that? You have to come from there. You have to come from there. On July 4, I get on a plane. What do I do? I return to United States. That's where I came from. When you leave this room, you return to your home. That's where you came from. The Bible is introducing the principle of what happens after death. You go back to where you came from. Now, let's add something else. Till thou return unto the ground, keep reading. For out of now, why do I return to the ground and not heaven? Because I did not come from heaven. Where did I come from? The ground. That's God. God is telling us, he's giving us the roots of the state of the dead. More than the roots, the root and the trunk. Because out of it was thou taken. Keep reading. Dust thou art. He doesn't say dust and breath thou art. You just dust. Keep reading. Uh, yes. Now that is where you begin the state of the dead. Actually, you go back to Genesis 2.7, how Adam was made. Then Genesis 2.19. You don't start in the, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Genesis. God said, when you die, you go back to where the material that made you is, is formed. That's the ground. You return to your origin. That's why when Christ comes, he shouts and wakes up the dead. You don't wake up people who are alive in heaven. And so my sister, yes, the state of the dead, the foundation of that doctrine is in Genesis 3 and Genesis 2. You go back to where you came from. People still die the same way in 2018 as they died back then. The principle remains, you go back to where you came from. There isn't a dead person who does not decompose. And the accuracy of the Bible is seen in the way people die. They decompose. The Bible says that's what you go to. And we see it all the time. 
then if we can trust how we die, we can trust how they were made. Are you following me? If God was right about how people die and what happens to them, they decompose, then you should reasonably assume that he must be right about how they were made. Am I talking to myself? Uh, okay, okay, okay. Well, let's deal with that. Let's go to Genesis 2, verse 7. Since you're making me work hard, I'll give you the bill. Uh, before I, uh, <laughs> all right, Genesis 2, verse 7. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Read verse 7 for me. For man of the beast, of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils there, and man became a? Now. The word living soul is the same as living things. I think in the fifth day of creation, the fish and the, uh, the bird, living things. Same thing. Let's look at the seven last plagues. Revelation 16. Let's read from verse uh, 3. Revelation 16, verse 3, plague number 2. Revelation 16. Verse 3, I believe it is, plague number 2. Read for me, what does it say? Start again. Read clearly. God is listening. And the second angel put out his vial upon the sea. Come on. And it became as the blood of a dead man. Come on. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who are the living souls in the sea? Fish. You know why a fish is a soul? A fish is a living thing. A soul is a living person fundamentally, now sometimes the Bible uses his soul to describe your, your, your disposition, your attitude, your spirit, you know, and, you, and uh, uh, the Bible says when the Israelites left Egypt, their souls was much discouraged by the way, walking through the desert. It meant that they, they, they were tired, the spirit was, you know, your, discouraged, the soul. Not some spiritual part of you that goes back to heaven. No, 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 no. A soul fundamentally is a living being. Go to Exodus, not Exodus, Genesis 12. We read from verse 10. Let's see soul again. Genesis 12, let's read from verse 10. An incident in the life of Abraham. Do you have that? Read from verse 10 of Genesis 12. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to sojourn there. Why? Famine was grievous in the land. Verse 11. Uh-huh. Come to near to Egypt, that he said, Sarah his wife, behold now, I know what? Thou art a fair woman to look upon. Keep everything. Therefore shall come to pass when the Egyptians, that they shall say, and they shall, uh-huh. Now, Abraham said they'll do what to me? Who is me? Yeah, but what does that mean? Does it mean just kill my body, not my soul? What does Abraham say? They'll kill me. Are you with me? Uh, you're not answering me. <laughs> Abraham said, they will kill me. Read verse 13. They eat, thou art my sister, that it may be well with. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Now what does it mean, my soul shall live? Whom did he say they'll kill in verse 12? They'll kill me. What does he mean by my soul shall live? I will live. Ah, come on, I'm talking to myself. Ah, nobody's listening to me. <laughs> I will live. <laughs> they won't kill me. Me is my soul. You know the concept of the immortal soul? It only began in the 4th century after Christ. It was originated by Augustine of Hippo. That's where it came from. He was a great scholar, but most damage to the Bible is done by scholars. Are you following me? The greatest damage to the Bible are those with PhDs in the Bible. That's no strike against wisdom. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. God gives some men tremendous wisdom, but they corrupt it and they use that wisdom to degrade God. No, there's no such thing as the immortal soul. There are two. There's a great error that came out of Genesis, and that is that he shall not surely die. That's the beginning of spiritualism. It is because of this that which doctors can talk to the dead man for you, so they say. And you pay money to have a man talk to dirt. Are you following me? <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Yeah, you pay a man money 
to talk to dirt. Go talk to the dirt yourself and save money. That lie has captured the whole world. There are two lies that have captured the whole world. That dead people are not really dead and the Sabbath is the first day of the week. Using those two things, the devil controls the world. Those two. And the roots of those are in the, are in the Genesis. Do I talk in Genesis tomorrow? Oh, okay. Tomorrow we'll pick up the Sabbath in Genesis. Now tell me what you've learned. Don't ask me hard questions. <laughs> tell me what you've learned. You be asking me hard questions. Yes, my pastor. Oh Lord, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> All right. Uh huh. Uh huh. By the breath of his mouth. Yes. Say that again. It's the same thing. Let me show you something. I'm giving the bill from you to him. <laughs> now, listen to this now. Listen carefully. By the word of the Lord. Okay? Were the heavens made. Now we have all the host of them. What's all that talking I hear? Are you praying? <laughs> okay. By what? The breath of his mouth. Sorry for my handwriting. It's very terrible. Now, this is A. This is A1. This is B. I'm going to call that B1. Now, Watch carefully. By the word of the Lord is the same thing as by the breath of his mouth. Where the heavens made is the same thing as all the hosts of them. This is called Hebrew parallelism. Two parallel lines run the same direction. Verse 9 does the same thing. I, know I won't write it. Look at verse 9. For he spake I'll write it. He spake, it was done. He commanded, stood fast. Stood fast is done. Spake his command. Mm -hmm. Pastor, are your easy questions finished? Or, now, what have you learned? <laughs> yes, <time. laughs> Okay, come on. Let God see you were listening. What have you learned? The size of God. God is outside of space, time, and matter. That's a big God. Ah. And he wants to have what with you? A, yes. A, it's like an elephant and a flea. A personal relationship. So Jesus says, come to me. Come to whom? The one who made space, time, and matter I will give you rest. Rest for your souls. How do you say no to that God? That's why when you have a problem, look at God. There is no problem as big as God. Not even sin. Because the problem of sin was as big as God, there could be no solution. There'd be a draw. Are you following me? We don't need a tie. We need victory. What have you learned? Don't assume you are cleverer than, oh yeah, no, a lot of us do. You are not as smart as God. You're not as smart as the devil either. What have you learned? Oh no, are you related to him? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, sister. Um, because you're mentioning about um, the word create and space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Spiritual creation, yes. So I just want to ask a simple question. It's not simple, but go ahead. Um, so in the, uh, in the sanctuary message, mm -hmm. the ark of the covenant mm -hmm. has 10 commandments. Mm -hmm. So um, is it, like, I'm just trying to understand the relationship of the command of God to his word and the commandments to his relationship. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not simple at all. <laughs> what is uh, the whole duty of man? Keep us commanded. Keep us commanded. Yeah, okay, now go to Psalm 119, read verse 96. And after that, I'll ask you again, what have you learned? Psalm 119, verse 96. All right, read for me. What does it say? I have seen the end of all. Uh huh. All right. Thy commandment is exceeding broad. That's the law of God. What does that mean to you? The commandment of God is broad. It's also what? Deep. It's also what? High. Which means there is a lot of God's law that we do not understand or see. Now, what is the second commandment? Why do you take so long? <laughs> What's the second commandment? No gods, no, 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 no make idols. No have images and worship them. And what's the first commandment? No gods. Go to Philippians 3. Look at how deep the commandment is, how broad. As I try to answer this simple question. <laughs> Philippians 3. I'm coming to everyone finished. No, 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 don't add yet. Don't add yet, sister. No, no, no. Don't create confusion. Come on. All right, Philippians 3. Let's read from verse 17. Nice and loud. Get of us. Of me and walk them which walk, so as you have us for an example. Keep reading. For many walk, of whom I've told you before, and I'll tell you even weeping, that they are the. Now here's how Paul describes the enemies of God. Go on. Who's? Uh huh. Who's? Stop. Whose God is what? Wait a minute. Wait a minute now. What's the first commandment? For some people, who is their God? Their belly. What does that mean? What controls them? Appetite. The Bible says that's your God. Now when you read commandment 1, Exodus 20 verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, you think of idols made of stone and wood. You never stop. To, my appetite is my God because I don't, it controls me. That appetite can be for food or sexual, whatever. That's my God. Or for gambling. That's my God. The commandment is deep. Let's look at an idol worshiper. Go to Ephesians 5. An idol worshiper. Ephesians 5. Let's read from verse 1 all the way to 5. Be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet, swelling, sweet smelling savor. Now verse 3. Fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become us. There's some things you shouldn't do once. Keep reading. Foolishness, no. Read four again. Neither, nor foolish talking, nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Now, microscopically, verse 5. For this you know, aha, uh -huh. manga, aha, uh aha, -huh. aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. What did you notice? An idolatrous man is a, someone who covets. You're not with me. Read verse 5 again. Come on, out loud. <laughs> is that out loud? <laughs> okay, for this you know that no whoremonger, no covetous. Mm -hmm. Who is an idolater? Stop. A covetous man worships idols. What does the 10th commandment say? 
How do you connect commandment 10 with commandment 2? Anything we covet becomes our guide. The commandment is exceeding broad. Now, if God's law is the whole duty of man, anything God requires, commands of us, is somehow covered by the Ten Commandments. Any, whether it's diet, managing your money, raising your children, everything God requires comes under the Ten Commandments. Because they represent the whole duty of man. Nothing God requires of you falls outside of this nothing. Everything God wants is covered by this. We just can't see it because our minds are affected by sin. So your dress is affected by the ten, controlled by the Ten Commandments. Modest dress comes under this. We just can't see it. That's why David prayed, Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I just can't see them. But as you come closer to Christ by surrender and obedience from the heart, you begin to see things you never saw before. Because the angels are controlled by this. Every command, every requirement comes under the Ten Commandments. There is nothing God can ask of you that falls outside the gambit of the Ten Commandments. Because his entire kingdom rests on this. And the only way to overthrow God's kingdom is to remove the foundation. For the last time, tell me what you learned. <laughs> Please. And don't follow my sister. She's a lovely angel, but don't follow her example, nor his. Now, what did you learn? <laughs> Blessings upon you, my handsome brother. Okay, anything else? Huh? What did you say? Yes, oh yes, and they hurt you. But we're not, uh, why you look so happy? Yeah, we're not charged, <laughs> we're not charged with them, no. but they're still bad. <laughs> they're still bad, okay, somebody else. What's that? God commanded all of Genesis 1, we come in contact with commands. The universe is the result of commands. That was the most blessed way to live in obedience with God's commands. But we're born with a nature that hates God's commands. That's why we need to be born again. You see, you're born with one nature, you're born again with another. And the other one now takes dominion over your life. The other guy, the carnal nature doesn't die until this mortal puts on immortality. Are you with me? Let me say it again, Bill. I'm going too fast. The carnal nature does not die until Christ comes. But when you convert it, the spiritual comes in and takes control. And so the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other. There's a constant battle. But by staying in contact with Christ through obedience to his word, the spirit wins and wins and wins. And so when the Bible says the, we're crucified, the spirits, the, the flesh, its rule is overthrown. That is what is killed. But the flesh itself, that nature, will not be destroyed until Jesus comes. Because character is developed as we fight against the flesh. Christ developed character the same way. As you say yes to God, and you make, you know, you have to make an effort to resist sin. Resisting is an effort. You don't sit down and say, Jesus died, so it's okay. No, you've got to resist. And sometimes resistance is painful. But the Bible says, resist the devil. He'll flee from you. But he comes back. Then you resist again. And you he comes back. He doesn't give up, you don't give up. All right. I got to stop. 10 to 5. Let's pray. My brother, were you about to raise your hand? Okay, all right. Let's stand.
We must always give God the glory for everything. Are you with me? But I must thank you for staying there. You stayed from one o'clock <laughs> to just about five o'clock listening. God bless you for that. God bless your studies. God bless your children. God heal your sicknesses. God enable you to deal with your enemy. May God's angels patrol around your homes and inside your homes. May God bless your going out and your coming in. And may there be people in heaven because of you. Let's pray. Any prayer requests? Let me take them now. Any prayer? Yes, Pastor. Um, can you pray for Calvin? Calvin. What's wrong with him? Okay, 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 okay. Yes, okay, 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 okay. All right, Brother Calvin, yes. Abraham had an acid test giving up Isaac. We must face the acid test. The Abraham test comes to every believer, but in different ways. We pray for Calvin to pass the test. Anybody else? All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, dear God, for your word and the beauty of your word. We thank you for the spirit of truth that teaches us when we're willing to learn. Father, let us step beyond learning to obedience. We live in a universe made by command, maintained by command. Dear God, since this command is divine, we need divine help to live in accordance with your law. That power is the spirit of Christ in us. As we bow before you, God, if we've sinned, forgive us, Father. You delight in mercy and the greatest expression of mercy is forgiveness. Where we've sinned, forgive us. And God, give us hatred for sin and give us a restless love for righteousness. Bless every man, every woman. Bless the children who came. Now, God, give rest to me and prepare me to speak to your people tonight. As we depart, let an angel escort everyone to his or her location. Watch over us tonight, dear God. Thank you for loving us. When you come, save all of us, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Let God's people say amen and amen.